the administration of Section 8 housing rehabilitation contracts by the Department of Housing and Urban Development. Testifying before Chairman Tom Lantos, a Democrat from California, and his colleagues earlier today were former officials at HUD. This is uh, the fourth in a series of hearings by the Subcommittee on Employment and Housing as we examine fraud, abuses, mismanagement, favoritism, and influence peddling in the awarding of moderate rehabilitation program funds by the Department of Housing and Urban Development. Today's hearing will focus on the selection process used by HUD for awarding millions of dollars of federal rent subsidy funds. A short while ago, former HUD Secretary Pierce testified that the selection task was performed by a committee consisting of the Assistant Secretary for Housing the undersecretary, and the executive assistant to the secretary. At a prior hearing, we heard testimony that one of today's witnesses, Mr. Silvio de Bartolomez, while serving as general deputy assistant secretary for housing, was so concerned about the selection process that he left town rather than sign the funding orders. It appears that the selection committee at HUD did not meet on a regular basis, but rather sporadically. Usually when Mr. De Bartolomez was out of town. Previous witnesses have testified that Ms. Deborah Gordine, former executive assistant to the secretary, who is appearing to the, today under subpoena, played a major role in the awarding of these rent subsidy funds. It remains to be determined, and the chairman has an open mind on this subject, whether Ms. Dean was the power broker or whether she is unfairly being made the scapegoat in this scandal. At our May 25 hearing, Secretary Pierce, in a classic understatement, said, and I quote, perhaps we should have watched the moderate rehabilitation housing program more closely, end quote. This is not the only program over which HUD should have exercised more oversight. Several days ago, there were stories in the press about another report by the Inspector General of HUD, which revealed that millions of dollars had been embezzled by private settlement agents from the sales of HUD foreclosed property. It is possible that the total embezzlement in this case might reach as high a figure as $100 million. It appears that HUD, under Mr. Pierce, monitored these settlement agents with the same degree of vigilance that Exxon used in watching over the skippers of its tankers. This Friday, the subcommittee will be holding a hearing to examine the diverting of funds from sales of HUD foreclosed properties. Witnesses at that hearing will include Paul Adams, the Inspector General of HUD, and Ms. Marilyn Harrell, the escrow agent in Maryland, who has been referred to as Robin Hood, or the five and a half million dollar woman, for having diverted millions of dollars during a four year period, in part to help the poor. Our hearings on influence peddling in the moderate rehabilitation program scandal at HUD will continue on Tuesday and Thursday of next week, when the subcommittee will, ha will hear testimony from Mr. Paul Manafort, a well-known political consultant, 
whose firm received $326,000 for successfully obtaining federal rent subsidies for a housing project in New Jersey. Mr. Joseph Strauss, a former special assistant to Secretary Pierce, and the business partner of former Interior Secretary James Watt, who received apparently about $1.3 million in consulting fees. Mr. Philip Wynne, ambassador to Switzerland, and Mr. Philip Abrams, former Under Secretary of HUD. I again, in opening this hearing, want to express my appreciation to the entire subcommittee staff for uh, doing an outstanding job uh, beyond the call of duty in terms of hours and weekends and, uh, and dedication. Uh, Congressman Shays. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. With every hearing that we've had, the story keeps getting worse, and it's fairly clear to me that Secretary Samuel Pierce found a department in disarray and left it worse than he found it. The question that I wonder is who was running the department and uh, hopefully we'll find the answer to that question. And in the process, I hope that we're able to make recommendations to the new secretary uh, on ways that he can totally revamp his agency because I feel it's in need of this. Thank you very much. The chair is delighted to recognize the ranking uh, Republican member of the Housing Committee, Congresswoman Rukma. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I thank you for it. I thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the opportunity of being here today and for uh, the, uh, your persistence on this issue. I think it's most important and particularly um, I appreciate being here since the Housing Subcommittee of Banking, Finance and Urban Affairs is the Committee of Jurisdiction. We surely intend to uh, be speaking and having hearings with the Secretary. Uh, your investigation is clearly opening up serious questions as to the adequacy of the law, not only the way it was administered, but also the adequacy. And I am here today to, uh, to hear the continuing testimony. I think there's, there are questions as to whether, at the very least, we have malfeasance in office here or perhaps, uh, and this is what you're probing, whether or not there is, was actually a conspiracy to defraud or to uh, going beyond uh, just simple favoritism and influence peddling. So I thank you for your hearings and uh, I can assure you that you have cooperation of uh, our committee in terms of uh, moving towards uh, corrective legislation if necessary. Thank you very much and certainly appreciate it. Uh, first witness uh, this morning is Mr. Silvio De Bartolomé's uh, former General Deputy Assistant Secretary of the Department of Housing and Urban Development. If you'll please come up to the witness uh, table. You raise your right hand. You solemnly swear to tell the whole truth truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. I do. Please be seated. <clears throat> At the outset, uh, the Chair wishes to state that Mr. de Bartolomez is appearing on a voluntary basis. If you have any prepared statement, uh, we will be pleased to place it in the record in its entirety. Otherwise, you may proceed in any way you choose. Mr. Chairman, uh, I thank you for the opportunity to testify. Um, I did not bring a written statement. I have a few words that I'd like to state. Uh, for the record, my name is Silvio J. de Um I am formerly an employee of HUD. <clears throat> I think I, if you would like, I could uh, go through and give you the positions that I had and the approximate dates. Uh, in February of 81, I joined the Department of Housing and Urban Development as Special Assistant to the Assistant Secretary for Housing and Federal Housing Commissioner. A few months later, I was uh, promoted to Executive Assistant to the General Deputy Assistant Secretary for Housing and Federal Housing Commissioner. 
In August uh, of 1982, I was uh, appointed as special assistant to, sec to the secretary. Then in December of 83, I was appointed as deputy assistant secretary for multifamily housing programs. And April of 86, I was uh, appointed general deputy assistant secretary for housing, federal housing commissioner, uh, where I acted as the federal housing commissioner in uh, lieu of an assistant secretary at that time. Excuse me, at that time. Um, I resigned my post on December and uh, December 16th, I believe it was, of 1986. Um, I have uh, since uh, moved uh, to Colorado and I'm living there. I uh, just wanted to state for the record, if you would, that I've tried to cooperate with the Inspector General and, and with your staff at all times uh, regarding this uh, investigation. And uh, you know, like I say, I'm honored to, uh, to be called and, and to shed any light you might wish. I uh, don't have much of a, a, a statement. I think I'd just as soon answer questions that uh, the members of the committee would have, Mr. Chairman. That's, that's very good, Mr. Bartolomez. And the chair, again, would uh, like to state for the record that uh, you have been an extremely cooperative uh, witness, and we appreciate that. Let me begin by asking you about uh, the manner in which this entire program was run. To put the question in some kind of a perspective, with funds being cut back drastically for the moderate rehabilitation program, these units became very valuable. Would you agree with that? Yes, sir. Um, Ms. Deborah Dean, former executive assistant to the Secretary of Housing and Urban Development, in an interview with the Wall Street Journal with respect to this program, made the following statement, and I shall quote, it was set up and designed to be a political program. I would have to say we ran it in a political manner, end quote. I have two questions. First, do you agree with Ms. Dean's assessment that it was set up and designed to be a political program? And secondly, whether in fact it was run in a political manner? Mr. Chairman, I'm, I don't know that I could answer that it was uh, set up and designed as a political program. I think that uh, when Congress had designed the program, I think that that was the furthest thing from their mind. Um, I recognize that when the units, uh, unit allocations were reduced such uh, that it became uh, uh, impracticable, if you will, to, uh, to give each public housing authority 10, 5, 4 units uh, and distributing them equally, uh, and then thereby giving HUD the discretion to decide which um, housing authorities would actually get the funding. Um, so from that perspective, I, I don't know whether it was uh, uh, set up or designed to be that way. However, one of the things that I came to learn as well, I could went... I, could I stop you there yes, for sir. just a second? If there had been adequate funds, so all of the legitimate requests could have been met, there would have been really no need for a selection process, correct? Um, yes, the, right. only, the only thing that you would have had to determine is whether applicants qualify for these units. And if there had been an adequate supply of these units, then all the qualified public housing authorities would in fact have received their uh, allocation. Yes, sir. I, my, my view is, I mean, obviously there would still have to be some decision-making process involved in that. Once again, making sure the public housing authorities were qualified to receive those funds. That's correct. But there would be a funding formula that would be done on an empirical basis. Uh, funds would be distributed uh, very equally across, uh, across the board. Uh, In terms of need? Uh, yes, based on a funding formula that, uh, that HUD had decided. Uh, there, I guess their community planning, uh, All right. policy now development when, research office. When the do. funds are drastically cut, then you clearly have to have <clears throat> a very precise selection formula which, however, can be objectively ascertained. Some areas needed these units more than others. 
In fact, it appears that rather than public housing authorities receiving these very valuable units on the basis of their relative need, it was the influence of the consultants, such as Mr. Watt, that seemed to determine who got the units. Is that accurate? I guess my guess is that yes, that would be accurate. Uh, one of the things that if well, I could... Is it your guess could I, could or I, is it your judgment on the basis of having seen it operated at close range? I would have to say that, that there were political influences involved. Uh, if I could digress just a bit and, and talk Please about do. the programs vis-a-vis -vis the mod rehab program versus the other ones. Um, when I came to HUD and, and went through a number of positions there, I learned pull, a great... Pull the mic a little bit. Yes, sir. When I went to HUD and I worked in a number of positions there, I uh, got to know the career staff a lot better. As you know, in the department, there are career uh, appointee or career employees of the department, and there are also political appointees. Um, uh, over the course of time, I uh, got to know a lot of the career folks and the work that they actually did in terms of judging that all uh, statutory, regulatory, procedural matters were adhered to in the funding of those pro uh, programs. And over the course of time, I learned that, uh, you know, as I got into positions where from a, from a staff position into line authority, I learned to, uh, to respect and, and to depend on the career staffs. Uh, recommendations and, and knowing that when the top career staff from each uh, office or each program would sign off on them, I knew I could trust them. And I knew that uh, from that perspective, it gave me a feeling of confidence. Um, one of the concerns that I had with the Mod Rehab program was uh, that, that that career staff uh, involvement was not really involved from the decision making process. Sure, there was career staff involved from from the administrative uh, side in terms of knowing how many units uh, there were available, knowing you know, the actual dollar amounts. But from the mod rehab career staff in terms of judging which PHA was better than another, which PHA had a greater housing need or whatever, um, that was not the case. And that was one of the reasons that, that I had stated that I did not like the program. You didn't like the program or you didn't like the selection process of the program? I, I looked at it as one and the same, sir. Uh, well, can how can you look at it as one and the same? The program was designed to provide I, I'm sorry, a modicum I, of housing for no, low-income people. Please, the I'm selection sorry. process determined which units, which, which public housing authorities would go to. Okay. Let, me, let me just uh, correct that and say okay. that uh, I did not like the selection process. Uh, in addition, since I was in an acting capacity as FHA commissioner at the time, I knew that I didn't have the authority to change it. Therefore, my, my feeling was that I just didn't like the program. And uh, knowing that I couldn't change it, that we went from that perspective. I find your observation extremely interesting because it directly contradicts what Mr. Watt told us a few days ago. Because Mr. Watt wanted to place all of the onus for the problems on the career staff, whom he likes to refer to as the bureaucrat. And I think uh, your point is that uh, vast majority of these public servants are trying to do an honest and decent job, and the problem did not rest with the career staff, by and large. Is that what you're saying? Yes, sir. Um, Ms. Deborah Dean says it was, a it was a political program, and you agree with that assessment. Um, if it was a political program, on whose behalf uh, was it administered? Who benefited from the program? I would say participants of the program, uh, from the lowest level in terms of uh, you know, from, I should say, from the consultants to the developers, also to the people that, that uh, received that housing. Uh, of course, know, that's a, of course. But from the political side, who benefited from the program? I would, I would have to say the people that were politically connected. I mean, that was... Uh, you mean the, the consultants? Bottom. Yes. One of the very interesting things that uh, Mr. Watt told us 
one of the few statements that he made on which I found myself in strong agreement was that the job he did and the job that similarly situated people did really would not have had to be done had the program been run properly. Do you agree with that? Yes, but however, there, I believe there would be always be a role for for a consultant or someone that is an expert in the HUD program. You programs. mean for a bona fide housing consultant? Oh, yes, sir. That's what I was referring yeah, but to. But not I, for a bona fide influence peddler. No, I, I couldn't, I couldn't uh, uh, view it in that perspective, sir. Well, let's, let's look at, for instance, Mr. Watts' involvement. What, in your view, was Mr. Watts' involvement? I, I really didn't talk to, to Mr. Watt about any funding. Uh, you know, I can only tell you what I've seen on C-SPAN and uh, uh, looking at, uh, you know, news, news clips. But, you know, and reading through the Inspector General's report, uh, basically, uh, you know, his concern was that he was able to talk to the decision makers that, uh, um, and, and indicate to them the need for housing in that uh, local public housing authority and speak in an advocacy position for it. Uh, I mean, that's, that's basically what I see. I also see what you're seeing in terms of uh, the political overtones, but uh, I can't speak to whether or not, uh, you know, a person uh, can ever help the fact that they are politically connected. On, I, that's not something that I feel qualified to judge, sir. Ms. Secretary Pierce told the subcommittee that in some instances, <coughs> such as the application <coughs> excuse me, pushed by Mr. Watt, he, Mr. Pierce, directed his staff to give that particular application, and I quote, careful consideration, end quote. What did that mean in practice? Um, basically, that, that uh, you know, when I was his special assistant, I would see notes that would come out that would, and that was, I think, his boilerplate of uh, phraseology to just to send it down to the career staff and make sure that, that it did get careful consideration, i.e., it did not get lost on someone's desk somewhere or, uh, you know, falls, fall through the cracks, so to speak. I, I really didn't look at it as saying you have to do this project. Um, but once again, it was, as I viewed it as more boilerplate than anything else. Well, isn't it reasonable to assume that all applications ought to get careful consideration? Yes, sir. That's why I viewed that statement of his in a boilerplate manner. You did not view that as a code word, that this no, is no, a sir. project not that he's all. interested in? No, sir, I did not. It was merely a redundant and gratuitous observation, since all projects were getting careful consideration? I, I don't know that I ever that your characterized testimony? it. I didn't characterize it as redundant or uh, whatever, uh, duplicative, if you will. But, uh, you know, just, that was just his style of writing. Uh, you know, some people will say, very truly yours, uh, you know, or, or please. Uh, you know. Well, he wouldn't say very truly yours in, in, in passing on a, an application. He would either pass it on without a comment or with a comment. That's correct. And you attach no significance to his uh, observation that this particular project application should be given careful consideration? No, sir, I would not. And these projects, therefore, did not get special attention? Is that your testimony? That, that my, you know, I don't, I didn't give him any special uh, attention. I can't say whether other folks did or not. I, I can't speak for anyone else other than myself. Right. <clears throat> Describe for the subcommittee, if you will, Mr. De Bartolomes, the selection process as it existed when you arrived at HUD in April of 1986. Well, I, I arrived before April of 86. Well, in, in this position. Oh, okay. In that position. Um, <clears throat> I think it had pretty much had been set up that uh, the uh, Office of the Secretary in coordination with the uh, Office of Housing would develop uh, um, a list of public housing authorities to receive funds under the MOD Rehab Program. Uh, How was that list created? Well, I think that usually when each fiscal year would end, there would be a number of uh, units that had been uh, allocated to each program category. 
Um, I understood that they would send a notice to the field or notice to, uh, to the area offices, regional offices, as well as all public housing authorities indicating that there were units that were available and uh, for public housing authorities to send in a letter uh, requesting such units, once again indicating the need and those pertinent <coughs> type uh, requirements, whether they were qualified for housing, et cetera, send them in and the Office of Housing, whoever was in charge at the time, uh, i.e. whoever was the FHA commissioner would be uh, named on the, the document. They would all be sent in. They would be kept in a book somewhere. Um, then uh, the folks would get together that I talked about and what decide folks? which... Uh, what, what folks? The Office of the Secretary and uh, the assist Office of the Assistant Secretary. The Office of the Secretary, the Office of the Assistant Secretary would uh, get together and decide which public housing authorities would actually get funding since there were obviously more requests than there were uh, units available. We they would then, I'm sorry, go ahead. they would then... Uh, um, uh, what criteria it. did they use? Sir, I, I cannot tell you what criteria they used. Um, um, I never really was part of that selection process. Uh, I think when Maurice Barksdale uh, was the assistant secretary, um, there were a couple of conversations that, that we'd had in terms of trying to make sure that uh, housing authorities in a specific regional area that had been funded before didn't get funding in the, you know, uh, again and again so that they, we tried to get a more geographic disposition of, uh, of the units when, uh, when Maurice Barksdale was there. And I think you know, there were just discussions on what areas of the country had been relatively underfunded. I think that's the, well, if the you, of those if discussions. Well, if you move into a geographic mode, I think you'll be in some difficulty. Because one of the peculiarities that we've found is that there was a very heavy geographic concentration of these awards. Yes, sir. And large, large sections of the country were very badly treated on the basis of a geographic distribution. So apparently it was not geography that was the main determinant, was it? No, not necessarily, I would say. Uh... Well, not, not necessarily, not at all. There was a heavy concentration on a few states and some very large states, uh, for instance, California, got relatively very little in the way of units. So there had to be other criteria than geographic criteria. I was not part of those discussions that, that discussed other than the geographic side. I... Well, you probably know that uh, two general counsels, former general counsels of, uh, of HUD testified before the subcommittee and we probed them on what was a verbal opinion saying the program is discretionary. You, you're aware of that? Yes, sir. How did you interpret the term discretionary? As I told you a little before that I didn't feel that comfortable uh, making the decision by myself. If, if I, I, and I really didn't have the opportunity to make the decision by myself. What I was saying was that I didn't feel that comfortable without the careerist signing off on the, on the uh, package. What was uh, Ms. Deborah Dean's role in the selection process? Um, I viewed uh, her role as um, uh, the final decision maker for the Office of the Secretary in terms of where the, uh, where the units actually would go. By final, you mean ultimate, the most powerful decision maker? I guess it, I have to tell you what I assumed. And I assumed that uh, she, in cooperation or in conjunction with the Secretary, would ultimately make that decision. I did not discuss individual projects with the Secretary. I did not discuss individual programs uh, with the secretary. So, uh, did you discuss individual projects or programs with Ms. Dean? Uh, I I did discuss them from the perspective of uh, when there were I think there was two funding document uh, rounds that I signed. Uh, I had uh, told the individuals uh, from the office of the secretary as well as uh, uh, my staff that I didn't intend to sign off on those. Uh, mod rehab packages without at least some career signing off on them. Uh, I would, didn't intend to sign them myself. I think that's where uh, Mr. Dermery had indicated where um, I left town rather than sign them. I just told them I wasn't going to sign them. I traveled a great deal in my position as the 
General I understand Jeopardy. that you traveled a great deal, but I think it's sort of extraordinary that an individual who, in terms of his job responsibility, needs to sign a document, feels so uncomfortable about signing the document that he leaves town. I mean, isn't this an extraordinary statement? Well, it is an extraordinary statement if you take it in and of itself. I, my view was that I just, I was going to let them sit in, in the uh, pile, in the, the inbox. I didn't intend to sign them. And they sat there for a while until uh, there was a time when I was out of town. In fact, one time I was out of the country. Um, no, I, I didn't, you know, and what happened was that I, those were then signed by whoever was next in uh, the delegation of authority. So I, from my perspective, I'd like to say that they just would have waited. Uh, there was an opportunity where I was uh, called up to the office of the secretary um, in uh, a meeting with Deborah Dean. I went up with my uh, deputy assistant secretary for policy, financial management, and administration, and uh, I was directed to sign packages um, of fund that were uh, already ready of funding. Uh, there was no real discussion, and I couldn't char characterize that as a committee meeting because all the funding documents were there. All I needed to do was to sign on the bottom of each regional uh, 185 funding document. So it really wasn't much of a committee in my view. Well, <coughs> let, me, let me pursue this a bit. And please be aware of the fact that you are under oath. And we are now dealing with some extremely sensitive and delicate and important issues. Please understand also that your feeling uncomfortable about signing these documents uh, speaks, in my view, well of you. You, you felt uncomfortable because, because, what, because of what? I felt uncomfortable because I felt that it could be viewed that these were being done in a political manner. Quite frankly, I did never... Well, uh, could, could they be viewed as being done in a political manner or were they in fact handled in a political manner. <clears throat> if, if you view the fact that political appointees were making decisions, I think a lot of people will say whenever a political appointee makes a decision, it's a political decision. That's a very cynical uh, statement. I, I, don't, I, I, I don't agree I, with that I, statement. I, I personally would reject that. Yeah. Uh, so would you like to try again? <laughs> um, I will try again. I, I viewed the a lot of the decisions that, that I had to make when I was dealing with a number of other programs as not being a political decision. I tried to, to think of it in a, in a higher perspective. Um, there were others that perhaps viewed them in a more cynical manner. Um, I did not specifically view the decisions that were being made on all the, all, all the uh, mod rehab programs in a, in a political manner. I viewed them as being potentially viewed as being done in a political manner. And I think that's, that was my concern. I think ultimately I uh, never really wanted to end up here testifying before Congress on behalf of this program. I think that was, that's quite frankly one of the things that I was concerned about. I didn't want to have to do. In, a, in an ordinary uh, month, how many days did you spend in your office and how many days were you out of the office? I, maybe four days out of the office over the course of a month. So you spent 75 percent, 80 percent of your time in your office. Yes, sir. I, once again, this is, that's an estimate. It's been a few yes, years, uh, and, uh, but I seemed to, seemed to be traveling quite a bit at that time. It seemed to you that you were traveling four or five days every month. Yes, is sir. Is that about accurate? But as these documents were sitting in your inbox, your testimony is you had no intention of signing them. That is correct. Well, you have to explain that a little better as to why you. That was part of your job responsibility. And, uh, and clearly you felt uncomfortable. Had to have a reason for feeling uncomfortable. You didn't want to be held subsequently responsible for having signed these documents. So you just let them sit there. And when you were out of town, suddenly these documents got signed by somebody else. Th is that, that, is, what that is what happened, yes, sir. Was there any discussion between you and the people who, in your absence, did sign the documents as to how this uh, unspoken, peculiar pattern 
continued? My discussions, I, I would ask the individual why they signed them. They said that they were directed to sign them. They were directed to sign them? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. By whom? By the Office of the Secretary. Anyone in particular? I would have to say Deborah Dean. Now, the documents um, that you refused to sign as a matter of course uh, uh, were eventually all signed by somebody who, because of your absence, had the legal authority to sign them. Is that correct? That is correct. Did you discuss this uh, peculiar arrangement at any time with Ms. Dean? I uh, don't remember having a specific uh, uh, conversation. I think that uh, over the course of time made it known that I didn't, didn't particularly like the program. I don't like the way the program was funded. Then I, I did not intend to sign those documents. As I indicated to, uh, to your staff and to you earlier, uh, there was an opportunity where I was called to the office and was told to sign them. And, and I did. Um, I'm sorry, you repeat. I was told to sign those documents and I did. I was directed to do so. That's one of the ones, I, the package that I indicated that. Who, who directed you to sign them? Deborah Dean. But you didn't want to sign it? No, and I, I resisted uh, to a certain degree. And uh, I was, Tell, I was will reminded. You, will you just give me, to the best of your recollection, and I'm certainly not expecting verbatim quotes, yeah. but we are now dealing with, with uh, uh, some very pivotal matters in this investigation. Um, on one occasion, or several occasions, how many occasions did you sign the documents? I only recall signing them twice. You only recall signing them twice. Describe for me each of these episodes. Okay. The, the first episode is the one that I indicated to you where I was called to the office of the secretary uh, where uh, with, with my deputy assistant secretary for policy, financial management and administration. Who is uh, that? That was Susan Zagami. And, and the two of you went two to Two of us were called up to the office of the secretary. And, uh, and who, who else was at the meeting in addition to you and your assistant? I only remember Deborah Dean as being the other So there were there. three of you at the, at the meeting? That's all I recall, sir. And, and the meeting was called for the purpose of, of having you sign the documents? That is correct, sir. Describe the dialogue. I indicated that, uh, as I've indicated to you before... What did you say? Give me I, the direct statement, once to again, the best I, of I your ability. I can't give you an exact... Uh, yeah. I wish that I had a perfect memory, but I don't. And, and uh, it has been a few years. Sure. And uh, a lot of things have happened since then, so I'm not 100% on this. Of so, course not. So we basically, understand. if I could just tell you that went up there and told her uh, that I was not uh, intending on signing the documents, uh, she indicated that uh, she had the authority of the secretary to direct me to sign the documents. You reminded me of the fact that I was only the acting assistant secretary and that I wasn't actually the federal housing commissioner. I had not been uh, appointed by the president of the United States and I had not been confirmed by the United States Senate, so I was just in essence a caretaker of that position. And the secretary uh, had the authority to, uh, to decide where, where those uh, units uh, were going to which programs and uh, that I was directed to sign them. I looked to, uh, to Susan Zagami and uh, you know, said that I said I think I remember telling her you're my witness, and then I signed the documents. Another time that the other time that I recalled was uh, I think long after that, and uh, once again I'd received a phone call, and at that at that uh, time from Deborah Dean indicating that I should sign those documents, and I did. You were told you had to sign the documents. Uh, I'm, I'm, don't know if the, they use the word that I have to. I was directed to sign them. Said so you, you know, you will sign them. Um, I guess I could have resigned. I that's, didn't at that right. time. Ultimately, I did. But uh, mm -hmm. you know, at that time, I was trying to become the FHA secretary, the FHA uh, commissioner, assistant secretary for housing. Um, you know, I was vying for the position, and uh, I was hopeful that I would get that position, and then I would have the authority to change that program. I was not given that opportunity.
Did it occur to you to question Ms. Dean's authority in directing you to sign the documents? <clears throat> I asked her if she had the authority. She told me that she did. And you accepted that because there was general knowledge in the department that she did in fact speak for Secretary Pierce? She did on numerous occasions where the Secretary had always uh, backed her up when a decision had been made. I mean, I had no reason not to believe her. What do you think Ms. Dean was getting out of all of this? I honestly don't know, sir. Well, let me go at it slightly differently. You felt uncomfortable about signing these documents. Why? Because I viewed them as being potentially viewed as being done in a political manner. Whether or not they were done in a political manner, I viewed the fact that, that ultimately they may be viewed as being done in a political manner. And did you convey this concern to Ms. Dean? Yes, I did. And she disagreed with you? Or she said, don't worry? Or what did she say? I, I think that, uh, you know, I can't really tell you what, I, I don't remember specifically what well, she said. Well, both of you are but very I mean, intelligent people. Both of you worked in very high positions in the Department yeah. of Housing and Urban Development. Both of you knew exactly what you were dealing with. You were dealing with very scarce, very valuable commodities that you were allocating to various entities. Sometimes these entities were public housing authorities, sometimes they were developers, which of course was contrary to the law because it should have gone to public housing authorities. Sometimes these allocations went to these consultants like Mr. Watt. Both you and Ms. Dean, let me ask this direct question. Is it fair to say that both you and Ms. Dean clearly knew that these were valuable privileges you were handing out? I certainly recognize it that way. I would assume that she would also. I can't speak for her. I'll let her speak for Of course for not. But, but it was your assumption that both of you knew these were valuable commodities. Yes, sir. And you expressed to her your concern about the manner in which the selection process took place. Yes, sir. Is that correct? And what, to the best of your recollection, was Ms. Deborah Dean's response to that? <clears throat> I think that, uh, I, I can't remember the specifics. Uh, I'm not asking that. you for specifics, uh, but basically just, if, if the overall, there could have, have been several reactions. She could have said to you, I share your concern. I'm very uneasy. I'm very uncomfortable. But I've been told by Secretary Pierce to do this. That's my job to carry out his instructions. <laughs> or she could have said, you're out of your mind. I don't know why you are uncomfortable about this. There is no political judgment involved in this. These are the best projects uh, that have come in from all over the country. What did she say? Uh, to the best of my recollection, I don't remember that specific conversation. But I will say that, you know, whenever I told her my concerns, she acknowledged my concerns and, and decided to proceed. So Proceed means? Proceed means uh, direct them to be funded. Don't worry about your concerns. Well, it, I, go I, ahead and I think she was idea. taking my concerns into consideration and decided that, uh, notwithstanding my concerns, that uh, the projects would, or the, excuse me, the programs would be, uh, would be funded. When you were at HUD, you apparently approved a project in which the wind group was involved. Is that correct? Um, I think the one you're referring to is uh, a Nevada project. Well, yes, I believe so. Okay. That was in the package. At that time, I had no knowledge uh, that the wind group was, in fact, involved in a Nevada uh, program. Um, I had no knowledge, uh, you know, I'd never been in Nevada, hadn't uh, ever been involved there. So basically I would say that um, I had not any direct um, conversations or, or relations or, or correspondence that I was aware of uh, with the wind group relating to 
their funding uh, or, or re relating to funding for a uh, mod rehab program in Nevada. Um, however, that was one of the packages, or that was one of the funding decisions that was in that package when I went up to, uh, I was called up to Ms. Uh, Dean's office with Susan Zagami. So, I mean, that was in the time that, uh, quite frankly, I was not part of the decision-making process. Um, I was directed yeah, to sign them, and, and I signed them. At that time, I had no knowledge that that was a wind group project or program that they were working there or whatever way you want to look at it. I just, I was unaware of that, sir. After you left HUD, uh, you did join the wind group, is that correct? Well, I, I went to work for Philip Wynn and uh, Phillips Development Corporation. I think the wind group is... Uh, it's a misnomer. I don't think there is really a wind group. There are a group of people that worked around uh, that office. It's a very loose affiliation, sir. And uh, I was an employee, or I should say I was a consultant to Phillips Development Corporation and Philip D. Wynn and Associates after I left the Department of Housing and Urban Development. I was under my one-year restriction of dealing with HUD, and uh, it was an opportunity for me to, uh, to learn more about uh, management of of uh, multifamily residential real estate and an opportunity for me to, to stay as far away from the HUD uh, staff as I possibly could so that there wouldn't be any problem in the one year prohibition being violated. In retrospect and on the basis of your experience in HUD, how would you characterize Secretary Pierce's uh, management performance of that very important department? <clears throat> I think that uh, Secretary Pierce had done many good things for the department. Um, I looked Could at him. Could you name those? I think the, uh, the termination of uh, some of the more expensive programs in, in, in light of uh, greater funding of numbers of units under the voucher and Section 8 certificate program. Um, I uh, would have to say the uh, development of the, the co-insurance program, the tightening up of, of some of the controls on uh, on some of the uh, abuses in the single-family FHA programs as relates what, to investment. What tightening up? Tightening up of the underwriting restrictions on the FHA single-family programs. Um, I think uh, sort of fine-tuning of some of the other programs like the HODAG program and uh, working on, on, on some of those uh, aspects. I viewed uh, Secretary Pierce as more as looking on a on a global scale rather than, uh, or a wholesale scale, rather than specifically retailing on individual programs or projects. I mean, he was uh, more involved in the, the overall perspective. I think some of the actions he had taken as relates to fair housing were, uh, were very good for the department. How do you explain that uh, shortly after taking office, uh, these time bombs seem to be exploding in Secretary Kemp's face? who, to his credit, is moving vigorously and effectively in trying to clean up the mess which he apparently found. I uh, would have to say I'm sure that the Secretary, uh, Secretary Pierce, when, when he came to the department, found a number of similar time bombs. Perhaps they weren't as, as studied or analyzed as greatly as this were. I, I, I can't say for you which specific instances they were, but um, I know that there were similar uh, allegations of uh, political favoritism, the Section 8 new construction sub-rehab program when the department, when the Reagan administration first came into, uh, came into uh, <coughs> to being. Um, you know I know that, that, that Secretary Pierce had an uninterrupted eight-year tenure yes, sir. as head of that huge agency. Uh, how would you evaluate his overall performance on a scale of 10? I, I don't know that, that I'm mm -hmm. qualified to give him a, a grade, sir. All right. Um, I, I don't know. I don't feel that I'm qualified to, to tell you what vis-a-vis -vis the others. I haven't studied others. I can't, you know. Do you agree with the actions taken by Secretary Kemp with respect to these various scandals that have been unearthed by the Inspector General? To the extent that I'm, I'm aware of them, I think Secretary Kemp has done a fine job. Um, there are... Uh, some of the actions may be viewed as being drastic in terms of cutting funding or whatever for specific programs, but I, I think sometimes you have to take tight actions, uh, drastic actions to stop things. And as long as you're stopping them in a constructive manner so that you're improving them in the long run, I think you're, uh, 
um, your actions ultimately will be seen in a favorable light. And I think Secretary Kemp is doing what he feels he has to do and, uh, and what, what I'm sure that the committee feels. And uh, based on my listening to the conversations that, that you've had so far, I would say that Secretary Kemp's actions are seen in a favorable light by your committee, sir. So uh, overall, I would say he's doing a good job. My final question relates to a statement in a Wall Street Journal interview Ms. Dean made. I'd like you to comment on that. She said that, quote, some consultants and political people uh, referred to her as, quote, the Duchess of Darkness because in blocking their projects, she, quote, stood between them and a lot of money. Further quoting, Ms. Deborah Dean said, they would come into my office, tell me some lie, I would have my people check it out, find that they were lying. These guys were shut out of the program." End quote. Can you explain to me what was meant by this? I, I think I'll uh, defer to her to tell you what that meant. Uh, I, no, I can't tell you. Congressman Lukens. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. First of all, I'd like to make a brief statement that um, I'd like to congratulate the Chairman on the direction. I think also the tone and tenor of the hearings. I think that uh, what the committee is pursuing here is extremely important and would hope to unearth eventually the extent of this kind of activity in the various programs. Having said that, I would like to address myself to this general background information first, Mr. De Bartolome. Are there many programs where this kind of activity is possible in HUD, as far as you know? Is this the only housing program where this kind of problem existed? <clears throat> From uh, an overall programmatic perspective of funding, I am unaware of any program that is in, at, at HUD that is entirely discretionary uh, from the decision-making uh, from the decision-making process in terms of where funds will go. Most every program that I was aware of related to either specific demand in the case of FHA mortgage insurance or in the case of uh, funding as it relates to a specific. Uh, um, funding formula. I know that normally when they would fund individual programs, um, the programs would be funded, I think, at an 85% fair share basis with a 15% uh, holdback, if you will, uh, relating to um, projects that have uh, a need for funding from a, uh, I guess that would be a, a, pass, a prospect or an, an aspect of the discretionary uh, funding process. Um, let's say that there had been a disaster uh, in a specific area and they needed uh, additional units, or let's say that there had uh, um, been litigation in a case of uh, a program and their units had to be, had to be funded from that pers you know, perspective. So, From your experience then, would you say that an 85-15 split, and I assume that's what you're referring to, is that 85% is, uh, is subject to very uh, s strict, objective uh, uh, analysis before the granting of a contract, as opposed to 15 percent discretionary, is that about where that break should be? Is that a proper pr I think proportion that to you? That is a very comfortable break. Once again, you know, all the in that program, uh, I w I'm specifically re relating back to the uh, MRH, uh, not not necessarily mod rehab program, but for the 202 program or or one of the others. Um, Usually what you have is if you have all the programs that are ultimately being funded, they're all being funded for out, of the, out, of the, uh, out of the programmatic requirements. And if you have, um, a, let's say, a locality that perhaps had an incredible need or there's some innovative housing or, as I say, some litigation, that additional funds could be set aside for a specific area. And it just, just not everything fits into a specific formula. But those programs uh, would have all gone through the staff approval, as I indicated earlier. I, I think the staff approval has a, uh, a very important aspect in terms of the decision-making process. 
Would you walk me through the previous system? I think it's called Fair Share. I read a great deal about it. I think I understand it, but for the purpose of record, Mr. Chairman, I think it might be educational for all of us if you would go through it step by step, what Fair Share consisted of in terms of steps of uh, comparative analysis and steps okay. of approval. Uh, that relates to an area that I would, I'm not the greatest expert on, but let me just give you from, from my perspective the way I see it. Um, there, the United States uh, Bureau of Census develops indications as it relates to uh, housing need uh, problems in, uh, in housing, uh, in terms of housing shortages, overcrowding, those, those types of uh, information. Uh, in addition, I think uh, HUD does a survey of the uh, housing authorities as it relates to the need and perhaps even the waiting list. Um, those are put together by the Office of Policy Development and Research at HUD. Um, they develop what they call a funding formula, and the formula is based on need. And they may be going entirely on census data. And it, it develops an Forgive me, they being the professional bureaucrats and the political appointees or simply the, uh, the civil servants? My, my feeling is that, that would be the professional or the career uh, civil servants. Thank you. The career uh, government employees, perhaps, if you maybe a better way to characterize that. But the bottom line is that it usually is, it's done, uh, calculated with a you know, computer cranking and all the data that, that they feel is pertinent, and they, come, they develop a funding formula. And so for each region, um, they can, they can uh, come up with a list that says, okay, region one gets, you know, 9% of the total allocation, region two, because it has New York, perhaps gets, you know, 21% or whatever, and it goes based on population, based on needs, uh, et cetera, and housing, housing conditions. Uh, that funding formula is, is a formula that can be applied to virtually any program as it relates to housing renovation. And so when, let's just say that the Congress comes up and they'll fund, uh, you know, a hundred million dollars uh, for a specific program, you can go down the individual area offices or regional office lists and there'll be an accurate formula that will be, you know, so you come up with the same amount that goes to each, um, each regional office or each area office in terms of funding. In your opinion, that was a fair approach? Yes. Then is it also your opinion that when they switch to the new system, that it would be, by definition, unfair? As, as I indicated before, I think it could, it's, it's viewed as being unfair. Um, then in the new system, the failure was that you would, you would introduce subjective judgment for this objective uh, computerized formula for determining uh, the distribution. Could you repeat that again, please, sir? Sorry. Well, then you're now moving to the area of much greater subjectivity in terms of decision making as opposed to the other being relatively objective because it's computer generated yes, based sir. on feed in formula facts. All right. Is there a need? in the discretionary, is there a need for a system by which the, the discretionary funds should also be, um, I think, subjected to some kind of scrutiny and, and certain steps before a single person or a single point of decision should be allowed to make that final decision? I, I think that there is, a, there is a need for that, sir. How would you structure that? You're obviously generating a system of comparison out of the career uh, employees, and then you're entering into a political appointee realm. Uh, how how could you structure? I mean, a, a series of sign-offs by three or four people had to sign off, or it wouldn't fly. I mean, how would you subject this to the same kind of scrutiny that would make it basically equitable, or well, equally uh, unfair, if you like? I, yeah, I, I think there there is a, uh, a portion in the statute that deals with this area already, and it talks about having to meet certain factors. And I think one is. Innovative housing, another aspect relates to uh, uh, major unmet need, another relates to a disaster relief, another relates to litigation. And I think that uh, as in that area that you're dealing with the, um, in a subjective area, but you're dealing with a small amount. You're dealing with developing uh, solutions to inequities in that fair share distribution. I mean, uh, you know, the formula perhaps can't tell you that you're going to have an earthquake in California, or a formula cannot tell you that you're going to have a hurricane in, in, uh, uh, down in Louisiana or, or from wherever, for that matter. And I think that, that what that discretionary, uh, f those discretionary funds are made available for is to deal with the inequities of the fair share system. 
uh, as it relates to dealing with an overall totally discretionary program, I don't feel qualified to tell you what would be the system that would set up. I don't, I don't know that uh, I personally could give you uh, uh, a list of five things to do. I, so I won't try that, sir. In your testimony, you seem to uh, have a great deal of respect for the uh, potential of the role of FHA commissioner, housing commissioner. And you, of course, tried uh, for that job or in the acting commissioner job for some time. Is it your opinion that that position could be strengthened to act as a counterbalance to some of this and that the responsibility should be in that office for the discretionary programs? Or how do you view that? Why did you want to be FHA commissioner? What role does it really play if, from your experience, that commissioner's position didn't really have any authority, especially in an well, acting role? I, I view that position as, as uh, uh, one that has had statutorily delegated many responsibilities and many uh, um, many re requirements or re uh, responsibilities have been delegated to that, and the statutory responsibility for that is, is rested with that individual. I think that as, a, uh, as an FHA commissioner that was appointed by the President and confirmed by the Senate, you are to a certain degree autonomous. And I think at that point you have the ability to stand up and say, this is the way that we're going to do the program. And I think you would have that at that time, you would have an ability to sit down with the Secretary perhaps and to, to uh, to get into uh, uh, to get into discussions as it relates to specific changes in the program. So you, you see and saw that position as a uh, an engine for change, actually. Yes, sir. Educate me. How many dollars involved in this program? How many contracts involved? Give me some idea. Of if contracts letting was abused, if it were abused. Out of how many contracts, out of how many housing units, out of how many dollars uh, was this abuse uh, portrayed or, or, or used? I, I, I'd rather defer to someone that, that had the specific dollar amounts. I, I can't tell you. I, Can you give me a handle? It's somewhere in the range of hundreds of millions of dollars. I don't, I don't know the exact dollars amount. So, so I you won't. don't know the, the general uh, total of the dollars involved in this program? <clears throat> Not, uh, I don't recall them. What about? The contracts that came across, the documentation came across uh, for approval. Uh, w would you see all of those in, in your acting commissioner role? If I was there, the documents were there. I, I would see the ultimate. Uh, you know, the 185 had to be signed off, and there, there's there in terms of individual yearly contract authority and, uh, and overall budget authority. And um, you know, they're, they go out. The terms of the contract go out 15 years. So that, we those were significant funds, day. amounts of money. So I, I don't remember. Let me get on to the nub of it. Chairman very astutely picked up on the words careful consideration. And uh, I can understand your response to that. I accept it. It seems to me, though, that the question that begs to be asked is how many times did uh, any person in authority over you ask you to give careful consideration? Was that a norm? Did, was that written by, uh, was that written by the uh, chairman on on all documents, or was this so unusual it only occurred once? I mean, I'd like to get a frame of reference for uh, the, the sense of your answer here. My, my answer is the same as it was earlier, and that was that I just viewed it as being boilerplate. Um, that was just something he always wrote on all of them. So it occurred on other documentation also? Oh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Could you give me a handle? I'm not trying to hang you on specifics, but did it happen a third of the time, 50% of the time, 10% of the time? Being, let's say you, you looked at 100 documents. Uh, I, you know, if I looked at 100 documents that he had written on, I would say virtually all of them would say, give it your careful consideration. I, you know, that's so, just the way I looked at it. I, I, I never remember seeing it anything differently. So the words careful consideration really did not trigger any particular response to you because it was not unusual for the not, secretary to personally write that phrase on other document applications for, for HUD monies. That is correct. I have in front of me statistics that show that basically in 81, we had a billion, 800 million dollars in the HUD, in this program for moderate rehab. And from 81 down to 89, there's been a steady diminution of funding down to 368 million dollars. So we're talking about 368 million dollars. Did, of the applications for that money, uh, did, in your role as acting commissioner, would all of those application documents have come across your desk? 
not across my desk. They perhaps to your the, attention. The applications would have would have come in, uh, you know, attention to whoever was the acting FHA commissioner, whether it was uh, me or whoever was in that position. Um, I'll tell you, just about every document that came in either was addressed to Secretary Pierce, uh, that or was addressed to to. Uh, to my attention when I was the acting assistant secretary, uh, anything that related to housing that is. And um, there was a normal correspondence unit that would take those and send them to the appropriate offices as related to, you know, programmatic concerns. So while lots of letters would come in, it would not necessarily mean that I would get them all in my inbox. Um, there, you know, there were folks that uh, took care of that, I guess you could say. As to signing and not signing documents, uh, you mentioned that you felt uncomfortable with this particular documentation that came across to which the chairman had reference and about which the chairman has already uh, questioned you. Were there other documentations about which you had the same reluctance or same uncomfortable feeling? On, and programmatic issues? Is that uh, what you're referring well, in the to? Well, in MRH, I'm trying to decide, was this the only time you didn't sign? Was this the only time you felt uncomfortable? Was this the only time you felt in your mind that maybe the political influence had gone too far, since we all know that there's always political influence in this city, <laughs> but they've gone too far. Uh, this was the only program that I had indicated my desire not to sign. You've already answered it, and I think you answered it well, but I would like to, to dwell on this just a moment. Could you go a little bit further into specifically why you felt uncomfortable this one time, since you said it's the only time you did not sign? What was so different about it that made you feel it perhaps had gone beyond uh, the realm of ethical consideration into too much politics. What what about this one that my, made, my made feeling, you hesitate? My feeling related directly with the lack of career government employees reviewing uh, the actual programmatic decisions and actually being a part of the decision making process. That was the basis of my concern. The lack of that. The lack of that. Uh, um, government employee, the career government employee involvement was enough to make me feel that uh, uh, I should be uncomfortable with that. Every other program uh, from, uh, you know, the Section 8 uh, uh, voucher program, the Section 8 certificate program, the Section 202, Section 8 program, the uh, HODAG program, all those programs that dealt from, from funding from the HUD central office to the area offices were to individual public housing authorities. Each and every one of them had a career government employee uh, sign off. This is the one that did not. And I think that is the reason that my major concern was. I don't wish to get into um, any other side issues, but just briefly, were there any other times that you felt that you hesitated to sign other contracts, or did, had they all gone through the system to the point that you felt comfortable and did not hesitate on any other uh, sign offs? Once again, it would, it would relate to the fact that career folks had not, uh, had not signed off on them. It was not a major concern until, except for this one particular time. That, that was, this was the, this was the uh, one particular time. There are other times on individual projects, and, and I'm not talking about mod rehab projects either. I'm talking about individual uh, project, uh, project in uh, you know, one location may have had some problems with it. Uh, and then it gets, you know, the area office can't handle it, the, the can't resolve it, the regional office can't resolve it, it comes into the career staff, they can't resolve it, and for whatever reasons, they may have honest differences of opinion. Uh, then it would come up to, uh, you know, through the ranks up to my positions or wherever I had been at that time, um, as long as I was in a line authority. And, uh, you know, there could be honest, uh, you know, disagreements. At that time, perhaps I would make a decision without the career uh, and career background, but I would have the benefit of their thought and the benefit of their analysis, and I would be able to make what I viewed as a reasonable uh, judgment on this. So, from that perspective, those were other opportunities, perhaps that a career person wouldn't sign off on. They felt so strongly one way, but after looking at all the options, I would make a decision. In this specific instance, do you felt that um, any particular employee had gone around you to the secretary and that you were cut out of the cycle? Um, I, you know, it's a, I, I don't know how you, you look at the organization, but, you know, from bottom to top, um, I viewed the top as, as being the one that had made the decision. I didn't look at anyone below me as making that so decision. So you assume on Ms. Dean's word that the Secretary personally had made this decision? I, I viewed that she had the authority and she had indicated that the Secretary was knowledgeable about what was going on and, 
You know, I had, as I said, it stated I had no reason to disbelieve her. I said that's a yes. That's a yes to what I said. To my question, that you assume that the secretary had personally made this decision based on Ms. Dean's word. My, my answer was that I assumed that Deborah Dean had the authority from the secretary. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Congressman Shays. Good morning. We have, um, during the course of these hearings, learned a, a great deal about HUD, and uh, we've learned a lot about uh, influence peddling in this city, which is alive and well, not just in HUD. And we know that uh, it involves Republicans who try to influence, and Democrats who try to influence, and they also try to influence Republicans, and they also try to influence Democrats. But I'm a little surprised in some cases by your willingness to, to state a case and then kind of, it seems to me, back away from it. We have um, Deborah Dean who said that the program, the Mod Rehab program, was set up and designed to be a political program. We have Mr. Watt in our testimony, excuse me, we, we had Ms. Siegel who said um, Mr. Watt was the right person at the right time and at the right place and so on. And we have Mr. Watt who very candidly said it's street knowledge that the going rate was $1,000 to $2,000 per unit. Plus all of us here have spoken to people uh, in our own areas. I had consultants who came to me and said that one individual tried to come up to her, him uh, and say, I can get you so many units in Bridgeport, Connecticut for $1,000 a unit. Now, that kind of process really stinks. And you were part of that process. Were you aware that this process was working this way? Were you aware of what the street knowledge was? Uh, the street knowledge relating to the, the value of individual units um, was before my time at, at HUD. I think that related back to the Section 8 New Construction Sub Rehab Program, where when we first came in, we found it, and, and, and you know, that's, I think that's when I first heard about a value of a unit from a developer's perspective. Uh, under that uh, program, I was told that it was, you know, that, that uh, consultants were paid uh, $1,000 a unit. So for their expertise, their knowledge, or whatever, uh, if, if in the case may be, political influence. I don't, I can't really uh, characterize some program that I wasn't involved in. Well, um, so the answer obviously is I, you know, I'd heard about uh, the value of, of the units. Um, sure. Now the value of the units are to someone who's able to influence the government to allocate so many units for a particular housing authority that then a developer can develop. Uh, isn't that correct? Isn't that what the, how the money is spent? Well, in some cases, the um, the consultants would actually work together with the housing authority. The consultants could actually put together the application to the housing authority under the notice of funding availability that each individual housing authority would have to uh, would have to uh, to promulgate. Um, I mean, there, there are a myriad of things that a consultant could do, also relating to the overall management of a property uh, during the renovation process, filing of uh, uh, documents as relates to, you know, draws under the construction process, actually working with uh, individual state housing authorities as it relates to acquisition of low income housing tax credits. I mean, there, there are a number of things that consultants can do. In some instances, they did very little. In some instances, they did a great deal. Bottom line is, though, that the consultant got up to 1000 to $2,000 a unit for securing uh, an allocation to a particular house in authority. Isn't that correct? As I indicated before, I, I, can't, I can't agree with you 100%. Um, in some instances, that may have been the case. In other instances, I think that uh, they may have earned their money other ways, too. Have you, uh, since this whole uh, scandal, and it is a scandal that's broken, have you uh, been paying attention to the testimony of various people? Yes, sir. Okay. To a certain degree. I haven't seen everyone's, but I've tried to watch. We had testify uh, that the chief counsel, Mr. John Knapp, decided that since the fair share had been eliminated as a requirement by 
Congress to HUD, he made a decision not in writing that the regulations were no longer operative. Regrettably, though, the only people who seemed to know that were the people who were aware of that verbal uh, decision. Did you see anything in writing that said that um, the fair share was no longer operative? I don't recall ever seeing anything uh, in writing. I do recall hearing that uh, I think perhaps it had been a budget briefing or at the Secretary's weekly meeting or something that the subject may have come up and they talked about the fact that Congress had done away with a fair share uh, requirement and I can't remember the exact mm -hmm. statutory reference but I, that's all I remember was hearing it verbally. Now, doesn't it strike you though that if you have uh, literally hundreds of millions of dollars to give out that you have to have a process whereby you can allocate that in a fair manner. In other words, everyone has the same opportunity for this money uh, and hopefully the best uh, development projects will get the funding. Now, my colleague to the right uh, very uh, aptly pointed out that when my colleague to the left was asking about the old system and the new system, she acknowledges that there was no new system. There was no system. There was no process. There were no regulations. Is it your testimony that you did not know that there were no regulations governing this process? I still viewed the uh, regulations. Uh, there are mod rehab regulations that had not been done away with. Um, I, I never viewed them as not being pertinent. I think they're called the 882 regulations, and, and they de deal with individual responsibilities for public housing authorities as it relates to individual... Uh, We're talking about funding, sir. Yeah. Fun and, yes. And the funding, yes, sir, I would have to agree. My view was that Congress had done away with those regulations as it related to mandating that the fair share formula must be adhered to. Now, that under is, what that basis is, did you make that dis decision? I think after listening to, uh, to the general counsel. So your general counsel made a determination that the allocation of the money would now be discretionary and there would be no regulations governing it. Isn't that really the basis of why you started to get a little uneasy? Yes, because, sir. Oh. Yes, sir, because the career component had been removed. It's really important for me to understand this program that you make sure that, that you're being entirely candid with us and, and, and I, I mean this very sincerely. Um, you are a well-known person to me, not because we've met, but because so many other people have said, you have said this about the program. And now it's our opportunity to hear from you firsthand. Uh, we have statements that you made to the IG. We have uh, memos that you've made and statements that you've made to staff on this committee. And very honestly, um, I'm getting a very mixed signal here. And all I'm trying to do is understand what really was happening and what was your attitude about this program. We know that there were no regulations, and now I know that you knew there were no regulations governing how the funds would be allocated. That means it's totally discretionary. We know it was basically then a political decision, and we know that you were uneasy about it. Is it wrong for me to infer that you were uneasy about it because you realized there were no regulations governing this process? And it is not wrong for you to think that. Okay. I did not feel comfortable without the regulations and thereby the career review uh, and funding those programs. Mm -hmm. So you were aware that the regulations weren't there, you were aware that it was very much a political decision, not decisions of the career employees that determined who got these projects. You're also aware that, that certain people who got these projects made a lot of money in the process. Is that not correct? That is correct. Okay. Now, um, since you've never said this to me, but uh, I'm being told you made this com comment, and, and I know you're under oath, and I know you know that, uh, it, it, one of the comments was that, that you deliver, uh, that, it, that um, you signed to one under duress another time because you wanted, uh, Deborah Dean asked you to sign it, and, and you were very candid, and, and I appreciate that, that candidness you said that basically you wanted to be the Federal Housing Authority Commissioner and then maybe you could change the program and so you succumbed to the request of Deborah Gordeen to sign that project. No sir, I did not state it in that manner. Okay, that's stated, the, okay. Basically if I could restate that, sir. Yes. 
One, the first time was I was called up to the office and I was, uh, I was perhaps uh, giving my marching orders as it relates to the fact that, that uh, the funding would be made. The second time, I was reminded of and, and let me our just, first uh, conversation. Before you get to the second time, and sure. you made it very clear uh, in front of Deborah Dean that you had a witness to, and the inference that I got from, from the very good questions of my chairman was that you were not signing this willingly, and you had a witness that you were signing it under That's orders correct. because Deborah Gordine said, I have the authority and you were to sign this. Is that not correct? That is the way okay, I Okay, that's the first one. Now the second one. The second one was, I viewed it just as a continuation. You know, as, as uh, I had been directed that first time, I viewed it a second time as being directed the same way. This time, no witness. Um, I don't recall having a witness, sir. No, sir. And I, I don't mean any disrespect because I'm not sure uh, it's something that, that I would fault you for. But uh, it seemed fairly clear to me that um, you, you acknowledged, and whether you want to change your earlier statement, that you acknowledged that you knew that you questioned whether you may have the authority because she had pointed out to you, Deborah Dean, that you were not the Federal Housing Authority Commissioner, you were the acting Federal Housing Authority Commissioner, and so you were not, you pointed out, you weren't appointed by the President, and you didn't really have the authority you felt you may need based on her comments. And so you said you carried out this process with the hope that's, that you would be confirmed. No, that is not correct. Okay. I didn't, oh. I carried out the process, it had no bearing or relationship to, to, uh, to whether or not I would be confirmed. The only bearing that related to the fact that uh, I would get appointed and, and ultimately confirmed um, really related to the fact that at that point, then I would have the authority to change the program. Mm -hmm. that's, that's what I was relating to, not specifically that I did it in an effort to, to get to that position. That's not the case. Did you ever recommend that uh, since there were, you were told, no regulations governing how this program was to be funded and taking the career employees out, in actual fact, you know, there's a basic conclusion on, on, our, on some of our parts that there were regulations and that they were operative, but you were told they weren't. Did you ever recommend that there should be some type of regulations? I, I think I did that on an informal basis, sir, um, um, indicating that, that I wanted to have, you know, once again get the, the, some career component or have some sort of empirical review of the way that the, uh, those funds would be allocated. Would you tell me your contact, uh, if any, with uh, Tom Demery? <coughs> Either why you were acting um, or... Well, when I was acting, my contact with Tom Demery, he was the new person that uh, uh, was ultimately uh, nominated and confirmed by the Senate. I worked as diligently as I could to uh, see that he was uh, his transition was a smooth one, and uh, as soon as uh, he got in, I looked uh, to get out of the department to get out of his way so that he could be in charge. I mean, I'd been there for almost six years at that time and felt that the best way is to let the, the new guy do it his way, and, and for me not to be uh, in the way, then I left the department. Uh, and I apologize for this because I'm, I'm, I'm basically new in, in Washington. Um, what was the base? Was the reason why you uh, were were you nominated? And uh, no, sir, okay. no, sir, I was not. I was never nominated. I was never selected. I was, uh, you know, I was. I viewed a candidate for for the position. Um, the president at that time obviously felt that perhaps Mr. Demery was was the best person for the position, um, and and I never was selected. So I, you know, perhaps they put it off to high hopes, if you will. Uh, would you, did you ever pass on to Mr. Demery that you had some discomfort with how this program operated? Yes, sir, I did. Would you tell me exactly, uh, not exactly, I apologize. Okay. Would you tell me as precisely as you can um, what, what you told him? Basically that, that that was the only program that I was aware of that didn't have the, the career component to it and that um, I was uh, uncomfortable with the funding of that program. That, that's something that he may want to look into and to develop uh, uh, standards, if you will, for the actual funding of that program. By standards, I can infer that uh, you almost use interchangeably the career component and the whole concept of regulations which would draw them in. So I'm inferring from your concept about setting standards that there needed to be some kind of regulations governing the millions of dollars that were 
uh, provided in this program. Yeah, there, there, once again, there could be regulations. It could be done by notice. Uh, it could be done, uh, you know, by a number of ways. I think the regulatory process, while it perhaps is more uh, lengthy and arduous, is uh, perhaps the best one to go by because um, it, it takes longer to get there and perhaps more people have an opportunity to comment. On a notice perspective, uh, if it's uh, uh, published properly in the Federal Register, I think that would also suffice. Um, but let me, once let me again, it's, it's just easier uh, um, from the career perspective and from the from the other perspective to do it, the regulatory process. Let me just say, easier is, is an understatement. Um, we, there's no way that Congress wants money allocated without there being some kind of standard and process for people to know how they can be a part of this, uh, a part of this process. If there are no regulations and standards governing it, at least from HUD's standpoint, uh, then how do people know uh, how to, uh, to be a player in this, in this process? I mean, it seems kind of obvious to me, doesn't it, to you? <clears throat> sure. I'm, yeah. I mean, I'm, it, let me just say you're a developer. I, I, uh, if I were a congressman and I were sitting in your position, I certainly wouldn't want to, uh, to know that I had voted on deleting uh, um, any, any rules or regulations and, and just give money to people. I, I wouldn't want to be in that position. Just as I, when I was in a position at HUD, did not want to be in a position where I was signing off on things um, that, that had no, no standards, no, no guidelines in terms of the actual funding decision. Granted, there were standards afterwards uh, when once the housing authority did receive the units. I mean, there's a big difference there. I, I, I sincerely appreciate your testimony. I just have a few more uh, questions to ask you. Uh, you were, and I know you were there six years, but I need, just need to nail down once more, sorry for the redundancy, exactly when you were the acting commissioner, the times you were involved in mod rehab, um, period you were Well, involved. I was, not every day did a mod rehab decision come up, sir. Yes. Um, from April 21st, 1986, I was appointed the General Deputy Assistant Secretary for Housing, Federal Housing Commissioner, um, through December 16th, 1986, the same year. So from April through December, so I was the acting FHA Commissioner in that perspective. So it's a pretty short period of time that yes, you were. Two programs you signed un under some duress, and, and one you chose not to. Now. Uh, it has been characterized that you simply, clearly by Mr. Demery, that you had told him that you didn't want any part of that signing off and you just left town. Uh, it's been... I, I didn't say that to, to him that I left town. I, I told him that... I, I hope know, I'm doing his justice and maybe the record will show a, a little bit. I mean, I, I'm sure that it's already been muddled through, uh, through the media so far that, that whenever a funny document come, I'd see it, up, oh, see it, I'm gone. I mean, that was not the case. Um, the, the bottom line is that I just let them sit in the, in the inbox and whenever I was out of town or at a time that I was out of town, uh, those documents were then signed by someone else. It wasn't as though I gave direction to anyone to sign them. Were you disappointed that you weren't there to sign them, considering your reluctance about the program? What I what I'd really hoped was that those documents would sit there until uh, perhaps we could have an opportunity to sit down and to talk about a better way of funding them. Let me just get to the better way of funding them. Uh, I just need to make sure for the record uh, that this committee that, that the Secretary said was established since there were no regulations, according to HUD, that as far as you know, there, were never, there was never really a formal meetings that were called during the short period of time that you were there. I do not recall ever being part of a, a meeting where you actually would sit down and uh, in the position that I was in, the, the acting FHA commissioner, where you would decide who did and who did not get the units. I mean, I don't remember having a, uh, a lively discussion of one public housing authority versus another getting funding because of need or anything along those lines. It, I've indicated to, to you in my testimony uh, the, the times that I did fund them and, and what, what the conditions were. I mean, it was, a, this in essence, it was a sorry. sign on the bottom line. No, I, and, and I think it's fairly clear. It would, I just want to establish it for the record that during your tenure there was, there was no committee meeting. And you were aware that a committee existed or not again? Um, I was unaware of any committee being, being a set up. I did hear, uh, you know, that uh, when Demery uh, uh, left, uh, or when, after I left, then Demery got together that, that he had, they had set up a committee. I heard it through his testimony. Now, I, I'm just like to close my line of questioning. Um, and, and ask you, how often did a developer come to you 
uh, for a particular project that they were interested in, or a consultant? Um, I, I personally don't recall specific instances where a developer would come. I mean, some people, developers come and say, um, you know, we've got this great project, or we have this great public housing authority, we have a real need in the community. Um, I, and I would say that I was not involved in the decision-making process, that that should be directed to the Office of Secretary. So I, I really didn't give them an opportunity to, to pitch me on specific projects or programs or public housing authorities, but really deferred it to where the decision-making process had been uh, taking place. Did you, uh, and, and since you've already testified that the, the career employees weren't really active players, then how did you end up with a list that you might go to Deborah Gordine and say, these are things, programs, projects that I think should be funded, and she might say, well, these are projects I think should be funded. Did you ever go with your list? No, sir. It, 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 just, it, it just strikes me as, as incredible that you were basically, admittedly, the acting, but that was your responsibility. I mean, you were the person, and, and I'm, I'm not saying, I mean, it, it had to make you wonder, and obviously you did. Uh, I have a few more questions, but I'm going to defer to my patient colleagues uh, who also have many questions. And I thank you very much. Yes, sir. We have uh, three colleagues uh, visiting from other committees, and we are delighted to have them. The chair will recognize them in the order that they joined us, Congresswoman Rukama. I, I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman. I thought I was not next in line. I didn't hear your uh, statement. I'll take, I, uh, uh, well, I will be brief, because I don't have too many questions from Mr. Debard Ptolemus. Uh, he was there for only a short time in an acting position and evidently seemed to have no real authority, although he has confirmed, I believe, what we understood to be the case, which was that there was no one who took the responsibility for setting up standards. There were no, it was totally discretionary. I think your statement was folks would get together. And, is that correct? Well, I, I later and, clarified that. And you didn't know who, quite how the folks came to their decisions in response to the chairman's question. I think you've made a clear, pretty clear indication that this was totally discretionary and, and uh, at the, the sufferance of uh, Deborah Gordine and or Secretary Pierce. Am I characterizing your testimony incorrectly? Yes, I mean, you I think are. you've been very straightforward in that and that you made no effort to speak with uh, Mr. Pierce, Secretary Pierce, on the subject, and that there's only, one, there's only one area in which I'm unclear. Did you yourself ever have any contacts with any consultants? Consultants would call, or they would uh, be in the department somehow, and they would ask me uh, you know, if I was involved in the process, and I would say no, I was not part of the decision-making process. You, were in the, the, you held the acting position, uh, but That's you correct. were not part of the decision-making process. That is correct. Well, of course, we all understand how deplorable of the procedure that is. Uh, but the consultants, were these any uh, consultants, uh, were any of the consultants consultants that you described as having legitimate expertise and were legitimately helping projects along? Yes. Some of them were. W were any of the others whom you knew to be uh, uh, using their political leverage to make the contacts, were these people calling you as well? I don't remember any uh, big name political uh, folks that would be actually calling me. But you were aware me. of them? I, I had heard of them, sure. I don't think they, they actually had called me. I don't recall the, taking any of those calls. Or and in summary, you made no attempt to um, uh, to reform the process well, or to express your grave reservations let, let to me just the state, secretary. If I could state that uh, in summary, um, I made no uh, successful attempt to change the program or to, cha or to, to develop standards. Well, did you, well, let me ask the question again in another way. Did you ever make any attempt to contact the secretary? to advise him that there needed to be changes in the program. I don't recall making specific attempts with Secretary Pierce. I may have brought something up at a staff meeting 
I may have not, I, at this stage, I don't recall. I do know that I made it known that I would like to, to, to modify the program. All right. Now, for clarification of the record, Mr. Chairman, and I'm not sure whether it is accurate in the record or not, but uh, the fair share waiver of the fair share proposal uh, was um, made by the Congress at the request of the HUD, the Department uh, of HUD. And it was because the funds were so short and the resources so limited uh, that it, legitimately we could not continue with the, the fair share program. Uh, that did not mean, therefore, that we had to abandon all kinds of, of uh, um, criteria, objective criteria, but that was the result. Uh, but, but I don't think the, the witness seemed to understand how the waiver of fair share uh, process came about. You're correct, and I did not understand that because I was not part of that process, and I was not there. I'd be happy to yield. That in Congress, a fair share will be waived. Yes. 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 Yes.
reading through the, the digest of HUD programs, I became aware of the Mod Rehab program, you know, perhaps my first week, but getting an opportunity to understand how the program was, you know, was, was administered, et cetera, from the local PHA perspective as well as, uh, um, you know, the application process, that, that became when I, was, when I was the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Multifamily Housing Programs. And, and when was that? Is that April of 1986? Well, April, April of 86 is when I was the acting FHA commissioner. Okay, and before, so when was it that you were in the, in the I, actual deputy I, position? De December of 83 is when I learned about, um, you know, learned more about the, you know, all the programs in the Office of Multifamily Housing Programs, and that was one okay. of them. And it was, so what, that was one of the programs under your jurisdiction? At that as, time, yes. As your deputy assistant secretary? That is correct. Well... Um, and, and that was a position in which you had a career staff that was to report to you about that program? That, that is correct. Well, what, was, what were the selection criteria in uh, December 1983? What, what was the, how did uh, Mod Rehab work in December 1983? I, I viewed it as being done through a, a fair share formula. I don't know. Um, my actions as related to that program related more to the overall administration, perhaps they're having a problem with this public housing authority as it relates to their administration of the program or, uh, you know, something along those lines. It did not really, re you know, or maybe the handbooks needed to be rewritten on the, the PHA administration of a program. I, I didn't really deal that much with the funding process. Well, but you were in that position from 1983 to 1986. That's right. And a large number of projects were funded during that period. Yes, sir. Did you have any personal involvement in any of the decision making during that period? I, I, I testified earlier that there was one opportunity, I believe, when, uh, when Mr. Barksdale was the, act, was the FHA commissioner, um, that there was some discussion as it related to trying to make sure the units were in a more geographical basis. Um, and and I, I just remember just one meeting vaguely, and I don't remember the details of that, sir. So that's the only recollection you have of any participation on your part in you know, funding decisions? From the actual decision-making process. Um, well, I mean, there, it, no, well, let me, if, I can, yeah. if I can clarify that, sir. Um, basically, I do recall signing off on uh, rapid replies or funding requests stating that there were, you know, uh, there were funds available in individual um, you know, program areas. So that's, I mean, that, that would be referred to the Mod Rehab Program the same as it would be referred to the 202 program, or the Section 8 certificate program, or the voucher program. So in essence, uh, you know, you have a, a document that comes to you say, stating that, yes, there are funds available for, for administration to the individual, or for allocation to the individual public housing authorities. So that's, well, that, is that's that a the decision document. to fund? I'm, I'm no, really confused. Tell me exactly what this document is in that my you're view, signing. In my view, that was a, that was a, um, a document affirming that funds were available. For funding, this you mean that the, there was that you could apply for the program? What do you mean that funds were available? That it had been allocated okay. to this particular housing authority? Funds, funds had been had been allocated from Congress to the individual program, and that funds were still available. I think what you the bottom line was that you wanted to didn't want to get yourself in a position where you had spent more money than Congress had okay. allocated to an individual program. But this was not a decision as to which public housing authority would get funding under any of these programs. I did not view it in that position, so I, I don't think so. You don't think so? Either you did or didn't make those I, no, kind of... I, I, in my view, in signing those off, it was merely a verification that those funds were available at that time as DAS for multifamily housing programs. In other words, you, were, you would get a fund... A, a, funding decision that came from someone else the and they would say is there the money to implement this decision is that right is that yes, what you're sir. saying that's what I'm saying so the decision had already been made at another level now when you were acting commissioner yes sir who did that who, who made that uh, sign off that you've just described that was done in the office of the secretary the, about the availability of funds no no, no you may, missed my question when you were acting housing commissioner after April of 86, the job that you had done as the deputy signing off on the availability of funds, who did that? The, that would be uh, the DAS for multifamily housing programs, and that would be uh, Hunter Cushing. 
So Hunter Cushing did that one. And did that happen before or after you or the person acting for you signed the list? It had been done before. I'd seen the list. and I'd never seen the list until it was already done. But in other words, the DA, so this DAS process that you've just described took place before the sign off for the particular projects at the at the at the level of yourself when you were required to make the signatures or when your acting substitute made those decisions. That is correct. So that was your involvement that, beforehand. That's, that's Before you became acting, that's that's the only that was your only involvement in funding decision. That is my recollection. Well now what in what form did those documents come to you? In other words, what came to you that you said yes the funds are The acting assistant secretary, those documents were, you know, I had been bypassed or whatever, but they had been signed off by the DAS for multifamily housing programs. They'd been signed off by the DAS for, uh, for uh, policy financial management and administration. As I indicated before, those documents is a complete package. They were already there, and that last signature that was needed to, on those was my signature. Well, how did you know that that this was not supposed to get any kind of a review from the people who worked for you in the multifamily housing section. Weren't they the ones, they weren't they the, the experts who were supposed to review applications for, for completeness and for appropriateness under the regulation for recommendations for funding? Wasn't that the way most of the programs worked? That's the way most of them worked. At that well, time, there, those, uh, the, the fair share was, was uh, you know, uh, was not in effect, I guess. Yeah, but how did you how did you find that out? I mean, how did, I, I, when I you started, Fair Share was in effect in 1983. Right. So how did it all of a sudden happen that it was not in effect, and how did you learn about that? I must have learned about it at a. No, I don't know what you must have. Okay. You, you I don't, I don't recall specifically, but I I believe that I learned from uh, from the general counsel, and I think it was at a staff meeting when that 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 was discussed. That uh, that the you know fair share formula had been waived, and and that, that it was not going to be done at that. Well, but that there's more than the fair share formula. You understand that. There's yes, sir, the I do. question of criteria for funding, which have nothing to do with fair share. Yes, sir. How was it that you thought that didn't apply? That I maybe I'm not understanding you correctly, but I understood that when uh, the general counsel John Knapp had indicated. That the fair share was no longer in, no longer in effect, that the decisions were to be made within the fully within the department at the central office. Um, is that what you're saying? No. Look, there are two sets of regulations. There are geographical distributions, as the chairman has explained, that are the, the fair share regs that that uh, implemented fair share that that were made discretionary by the congressional action, mm -hmm. and then there are further requirements in judging particular projects. Now, Mr. Knapp testified that he had given an oral opinion that that also was suspended, although he couldn't explain to us how the APA was also expend, suspended, so he didn't have to do any of the procedural niceties to repeal or suspend that regulation. But he's since written a letter to the chairman of the subcommittee saying that isn't so, and that he never said that. And apparently now nobody ever said that. So I'm very interested in knowing who said it to you. Who told you that these regulations weren't in effect? At this stage, I can't. I don't recall who specifically said it. I thought it was John Knapp that said that the fair share distribution had been uh, had been waived. And I, you know, whether we got this through a budget briefing, whether I learned it from Janet Hale, who was the DAS for policy and budget at that time, whether I I, I can't remember specifically. I, I just can't recall. I wish I had a perfect memory, sir, but I do not. And and uh, um, I. I can't recall. Uh, okay, now you've said that when you were in the acting housing commissioner position, uh, you were very disturbed about um, about the way this project, this program was working, and you were disturbed because there was no structure, no regulations, and there was no sign off by career people who made judgments. Is that an accurate summary? Yes, sir. Um, now, when was it that you were instructed to sign, and after declining initially you did sign uh, I do not remember the exact date uh, 
I think it may be listed in, in the Inspector General's report. I don't well, I have, a, I have a number of projects you signed off on, and one extensive list of 23 was signed off on September 5th, 1986, which seems to be the first extensive list okay. that you signed. I, that may be the one. Well, there was an earlier uh, time when there was a list of 22 projects that was signed off by Ms. Zagami, and, and is that... Um, is that list, are you familiar with that occasion? Uh, what date was that again? That was in May of 1986, May yeah, 22nd. I, I believe that was an opportunity or an opportunity that, that uh, I was out of the country. Well, you were out of the country. Did you know there was a list around that they wanted you to sign? I, I don't recall knowing there was a list around at that time. No, sir, I did not. Well, did, were you informed when you got back that a list of 22 projects that you were responsible for had been signed off in your absence? Um, I think I received a phone call that said that, that, you know, from one of my assistants saying that they're funding a, you know, round of mod rehab and just wanted you to know that, um, sort of informing me. So that's how I found out I got to receive a phone call. Were you out of the country a lot so that would, you would expect no, that, that were, were, were there sign-offs being done on your behalf frequently in other programs? Uh, not to my knowledge, no, sir. Well, when you came back, did you take any action? to look into why the decision was made to have this signed off in your absence rather than to leave it to you to review? I don't remember going through any extensive uh, research. I, my, my, uh, I only made certain assumptions that the Office of the Secretary wanted it funded. They wanted it funded at that time, and they funded it. Well, uh, just did, my assumption. It, you made that assumption. Did you ask? Sure, I asked. Did you, who did you ask about this instance of a sign off in your absence? I asked my staff. People who worked for you, and what'd they tell you? They told me that they were directed to sign them. Zagami? Zagami, correct. And did you inquire of, who, who did she say instructed her to sign? Deborah Dean. And did you inquire of Ms. Dean why this was done in your absence? Uh, I don't recall specifically inquiring. Well, did you think you had any responsibility to inquire why this was being done? Yes, I did. And so why didn't you? I, I think I've already indicated to, to the panel that, that I did inquire before. I was told that, I that decisions were made in the office of the secretary. Will my colleague yield for a moment? I'd be happy to. Is it my, it's my impression, and correct me if I'm wrong, that you were quite happy that these documents were signed in your absence. You were, you were hoping that they would be signed in your absence because you didn't feel comfortable signing them. You knew that the secretary or Ms. Dean wanted them signed and it was a sort of a comfortable arrangement of understandings that while they wouldn't put pressure on you to sign except on two occasions, the documents would be signed on the days you were gone and since they had to approve your travel requests, Ms. Dean or somebody in the secretary's office knew when you would be gone. They had the documentation of your projected days of absence. So they went down on those days to your office and had your assistant sign them. Isn't that accurate? I think that, that's perhaps, that is an accurate uh, assessment. Uh, so I, you, in fact, were pleased well, with the paper. Well, I, really, I can't say that I was really pleased. Were you really? I mean, yeah, I had I had a certain degree of relief. Um, as I <clears> indicated <throat> before, I didn't want to sign them. And uh, if they were to be signed, I, someone else had signed them that had the authority. I mean, you know, I was glad that I didn't have to sign them, sure. But uh, uh, it wasn't like there was a cozy arrangement or anything along those lines, sir. It was an unspoken arrangement. I, yes, I guess you could characterize it in that manner. Okay. Well, my, my concern with, with this these questions, this answer is just, um, was that true the first time? In other words, you, there was, we, we know that in, by September you had been once forced to sign and then uh, everyone has described the situation of, of, of a knowledge, uh, whether, whether it was spoken or unspoken, that you were out of town in September when, when a substantial additional list was signed. But I wanted to focus on May, which when you were new as acting housing commissioner and where the signing was done in your absence, 
and whether you raised any objections to that. I, I don't recall specifically raising objections. I don't even recall that funding round being funded. And do you recall anything about knowing before it happened that there was this list they wanted done? At this stage, I do not, sir. Did you ever have any input into which projects were on the list while you were acting I, commissioner? I don't review, remember having specific input, no, sir. So you don't recall ever having put any project on the list? I personally did not, no, sir. Did um, anyone in your, who would work for you, who was, who was not, under your supervision my, do not, so? Not to my knowledge. I, I, because I wasn't part of the process, I can't tell you what other folks did. Okay, but, so but I, they didn't I do it through you? No, sir. Now, you, you were told by Deborah Dean on several occasions that you, you either had to approve or these would be approved. This, the secretary wanted these done, is that right? Yes. Did you ever raise that question with the secretary, personally? I don't recall if I did or I didn't. I think I made it known that, that I wasn't that comfortable with that program. I don't remember specifically saying, Mr. Secretary, you know, I, um, I have a problem with this program. I, I just don't recall it at, that, at this time, if I said that or not. Well, how often did you, were you personally with the secretary in a business setting? Not very frequently, sir. Well, you said something about secretary's weekly meeting. Was that, yeah. Did that include the secretary most weeks? Sometimes. Not, not every week, sir. There were certain weeks that uh, you, he was there or he wasn't there. <laughs> um, no, I mean, the, the, you know, if the secretary was not there, the undersecretary would, would conduct the meeting. Or if there was no undersecretary, then the general counsel would conduct the meeting. It was a weekly staff meeting. And, uh, was there ever a meeting? Um, where the secretary was present, where the mod rehab program was discussed? I don't recall a specific meeting to that. Effect. Were there minutes kept for these meetings? Uh, I believe there would be of that annual. Who was responsible for those minutes? I would have to say the executive assistant would be responsible for them. Perhaps the executive assistant didn't take them. When I was special assistant to the secretary, um, it would float among the special assistants to take minutes of the meeting, they would be submitted to the executive assistant. So there may be, uh, you know, there minutes, may be minutes, minutes of, of those meetings. meetings. Yes, sir. Now, you, you had a number of other housing programs under your authority, and you named a number of them before, Section 8 voucher program, the Section 8 certificate program, et cetera. Two that you did not mention, the loan management set-aside program and the Section 312 rehabilitation program. Are you familiar with both of those? Uh, yeah, yes I am. Now those are, it's interesting you didn't mention those because those are two other programs which were administered on a discretionary basis. Um, 312, really? I don't recall that being, and, and also loan management. I don't recall those being done on a discretionary, well, there's really discretionary the basis. The general loan management program, but there was a loan management set aside program and there's been a subsequent IG's report yeah. raising questions about how that was handled as well. Do you have any recollection of okay. those programs? The, the loan management program is, was named in its entirely LMSA, loan management set aside. That did not refer to some that were set aside or some that were not set aside. I, I always reviewed those or viewed those as being loan management set aside and career staff did sign off on LMSA. Uh, 312, I don't remember that being that okay. particularly an active program. Um, and, and maybe I'm just forgetting what 312 was. I don't know if that was the... Uh... Okay, let me, let me um, ask you a couple of things that you should remember. Um, there was a... There was a... Um, a uh, situation that the IG went into with you about um, funding in Region 10 in which um, you were, were operating as a consultant after you had left HUD. Now it is said that you, in the IG's report, that you um, attempted to get the HUD regional office to require the uh, housing authority not to re-advertise a project in which you 
your consultant was a developer, the consultant you were working with, Win and Associate. Um, is that true? Um, at that time, I would, my client was, was not Win and Associates. It was RSF Management. Mr. Wynn at that time had left um, uh, as uh, ambassador to Switzerland, and my clients were uh, um, other developers. Mr. Baker, Silvestri, and I think that and Queen and I think were the actual um, developers on that project. I went in to talk to the regional housing director, Diana Goodwin. Um, she had apparently required that the, the project have to be would have to be uh, re-advertised um, because she felt that there that a dry NOFA was not acceptable. Uh, and talking to her. Uh, I tried to convince her that the dry NOFA was an acceptable process. Um, she, you know, continued to maintain that it was not. In addition, she said that the local public housing authority, the Richland uh, Housing Authority, had never had an administrative plan for mod rehab approved. Therefore, they were not really eligible to do the dry NOFA. When she said that, I, I said, uh, okay, that's, you know, that's basically it. So I never, I mean, I tried to convince her that, that it was uh, an acceptable process, and I think it would have been had they had an active mod rehab program. And what she was saying is they never even had, they weren't that experienced. And therefore, since they didn't have an admin plan approved that they couldn't do a dry NOFA, and I, you know, I, I accepted that. She, you, I she, never went to Washington. She made a statement saying that, that you threatened the sewer because okay. your clients didn't get the final okay. allocation of units. Is that true? Um, no, no, sir, that is not true. Um, she had made a statement um, that, and I'd read that, and I think that is uh, totally false. I think uh, what, what I talked about was after the admin plan had been approved and the process had gone through, the Richland Housing Authority had gone and had uh, five more projects that they, under a new NOFA process, um, I... rich off these programs and they lined up at the trough of federal subsidies. HUD has become a backwater of mismanagement, negligence, and abuse. One of the worst run agencies I have seen in all my years of government. Much attention just recently, and we're having her come Friday, has, has focused on a woman named Robin HUD, who allegedly diverted millions in HUD funds to the poor. Well, whatever the facts are of that case, it's clear that Robin Hoodlums at HUD 
decimated our nation's housing programs and perpetrated a shameless crime on this country. Now, in the course of this investigation, I would say to our witnesses, I open up my questioning, we've had all the witnesses sort of point the finger at everybody else. A succession of witnesses have laid blame for these gross abuses with everyone but themselves. I hope today that Ms. Dean and others will have the courage and conviction to provide straight answers to our questions about what went on amid the confusion at Pierce's HUD. Okay, I'd just like to ask the witness a couple of questions, and I know the chairman wants us to move along, so I'll make my questions brief. First, I'd like to know a little bit more about Deborah Dean's role in the selection process. Did she ever tell you to fund certain projects? She gave me a, they presented me with a package which had certain programs in it. No, I was never directed to fund certain projects. Well, were, can you explain the difference? Yes, sir. From, uh, from HUD's, HUD funds public housing authorities, the, the units. Uh, the public housing authorities then go through a NOFA process in which they pick individual projects. So I was never directed to fund a specific project. But the I, program I, was, was quite project specific. Um, I don't remember project specific. It was never on the funding documents. Did you ever hear words of why certain programs were being funded? Did you ever hear words of this person knows so and so or this person? I, I really didn't get into the decision making process, sir. So. I don't recall. Well, but you said those. something bothered you about how they were funded. You've said that over yes, sir, and over I again. I, to I told the committee that, and I yeah. will repeat that I did not like the fact that there was not a career component um, reviewing well, all the funding decisions. And you never asked questions as to what about this one, what about that one, why this list, why that, why not that. Never asked those questions. Well, sir, when you're being directed to sign of uh, the documents, there's very little discussion at that stage. Mm -hmm. You, uh, I think most people would have discussion. I think most people in your position, you seem to be an honorable chap, would have said, well, why is this one so important? You never heard, or at all the meetings you were at, you never heard a word mentioned about specific projects? I, I don't recall specific projects being mentioned, sir. You never recall, never. Not even once. Don't There's not one example that sticks out in your head. Not in uh, my mind, sir. In your head. Okay. My next uh, questions are, um, how did you, did you see any, did, you see, did it seem to you the process was a fair process? No, sir. Did not. Did you see any difference between the projects that were funded and weren't funded? You never got to look at the ones that weren't? That is correct. I, I'm sort of perplexed about what you thought your role was here, just to be sort of one of these automatic pen writing machines that when they put a document in front of you, you just signed it? When you, I was, did you, you never saw a project that wasn't funded? I didn't fund projects, as I indicated before. Programs. What, programs, yes. You never what, saw programs that weren't funded in this I, area? I don't recall seeing them that, that were not. You know, I always recall, I recall being given a specific uh, funding documents that had specific public housing authority programs being funded. Just told to sign them. It's that simple. That, I mean, that's... Mm -hmm. It's very... I mean, I don't understand what you did with the rest of your time in between the months that they brought you the statements to sign, what you did the rest of the time. You never saw a program that wasn't funded. You never asked a question about why these programs were funded. Is that sort of a dereliction of your duties? I don't know if uh, I would characterize it in that manner. Again, I'm not implying any venality or bad motive or anything else to you, but I would have to characterize those as a dereliction of one's duties. I mean, you don't just sit there and sign something that someone puts in front of you. Well, if you're directed to by the secretary, I think that... Well, were uh, you directed to yes. never directly by the secretary? Not by the secretary, but by the secretary's executive assistant. And you As I indicated, I testified before, I had no reason to, to doubt that. You never asked the secretary, what about not this Not specifically. As I indicated before, the... Uh, Secretary had always backed his executive assistant up. Let me ask you another question. You, you testified that while you were visiting Demery's office in March 25th, 1988, this is after you're out of government, uh, Demery had a memo in front of him setting up a policy now for 
for this program. He asked you if you wanted a copy, you gave, and he gave it to you. Is that correct? Well, I, I asked him, I said, well, what's new on, on the mod rehab program front? Mm -hmm. that, you know, I knew that he had wanted to change it. He said, I just have today the, the latest change. Right. And, and he you, was rather proud that he was able to make those right. changes. But they weren't he gave yet me in a effect. Copy of them. Isn't that correct? Sorry? They weren't yet in effect. Oh, yes, they were. Well, they were in effect. They were in so effect. So everyone had <laughs> access to this information at that time? The document that he had had just been signed was to be, you know, spent out, sent out to the field. It was, a, it was a coincidence that I was there at the date that the document was signed. Once a document goes out to the field, I view it as being public information. Any individual could have gotten a copy of that information uh, from the local offices, and, and, or he could have gotten it from uh, Freedom Information Act. Why did then Mr. Queenan, another former official at HUD, get the document after you gave it to him and go to public housing authorities and tell them, here, here is some new information, why don't you uh, use it? Sure. Why didn't the public, if the public housing authorities had access to it, couldn't they have just gotten it themselves? I would have thought that, that would have been the case. I had no idea that Mr. Uh, Queenan was going to do that. Perhaps you should ask Mr. Queenan why he did that, sir. Maybe through the chairman's uh, largesse, we will be able to do that. Um, did you have, finally, do you have any contact with Joseph Strauss? Upon occasion, yes. Can you describe it? Usually the conversations with Joe Strauss would was relate. Was he in government at the time? That is correct. He was, he was a former, excuse me, he was a former special assistant to the secretary. Right. And your, your contact with him occurred while he was special while assistant was special or assistant. after he was out? And, as and after, I mean, oh. it was both, sir. What kind of contact did you have with him after he was out, but most, you were still in? Most conversations that I would have with him would relate to um, dealing with transfers of physical assets for trouble properties to new, to new uh, owners. They would deal with property disposition projects. Uh, I remember one specific project in, in New Jersey, um, which was a project called Corinthian Towers, which is an old Section 8 new construction sub-rehab project that uh, got halfway built and then the developer had a problem and so he was part of a new team that was going in to take it over and to renovate it. I mean, th my... He called you directly while you oh, were he called, acting... He called every, anyone he possibly could to try and, and get attention right. to that. Mm -hmm. uh, did Jim Watt ever call you on this? Not on that pro project. Did I don't remember speaking... I, I have met Jim Watt, but I don't remember speaking to him on any programs I, or projects. I, I just don't recall. Where'd you meet him? I think it was at a fundraiser or a reception over at the Capitol Hill Club. Uh, he was also... Um, wait, 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 let's go. A fundraiser for whom? Um, I think a Republican fundraiser. And I don't think it was for any specific m member. I think it might have been something... RNC, it was at the very... It was, the, you know, it was something along those lines, yeah. uh, right at the beginning of the administration. And, uh, oh, this was before, while he was Secretary of Interior? Yeah. Yes, sir. Okay, but you don't, you, did you ever hear his name mentioned around as being connected to one project or another while I, you I were I heard advised? him as being connected to Joe Strauss. To Joe Strauss? Yes. How about the specific programs or projects? No, sir. Okay. Um, Mr. Chairman, I know that you want to move the committee along. Might I have the permission of the subcommittee, maybe through your office, to submit further questions in writing to the witness? We'll be happy to give you Thank that. You. Thank you very much. Before we move on to our next uh, witness, Mr. Chase has a couple of questions. Just a, a few very short ones. I want to establish for the record, uh, we had um, the IG's report in which Deborah Gordine, uh, in talking about this committee that you never attended, um, and I want to make sure that your testimony, how it fits into her testimony here for the record, um, she said, dealing with this committee on mod rehab, there was no specific schedule for the committee. This is not a direct quote. This is the IG's report. There was no specific schedule for the committee to meet, so essentially the committee met on sort of an ad hoc basis whenever there were mod rehab units to be awarded. When some of the committee meetings were held, the designated committee members were not always available to participate. Consequently, a number of other HUD staff members were called upon to fill in on the committees. She can recall the following individuals having served on the mod rehab selection committee. Janet Hale, former General Deputy Assistant Secretary to the Housing, Sylvia DeBart Ptolemies, um, former General Deputy Assistant Secretary for Housing, John Knapp, former General Counsel, and Shirley Weissman, former Deputy Assistant Secretary for Single Family Housing. Um, 
We have Mr. Knapp testifying that he did not participate in any of these meetings, and I just want, for the record, uh, a last time review, did you in any way participate in any of these committee meetings? The only way I participated was going to a meeting where I was directed to sign those units. Thank you, and just one last area. Uh, Hunter Cushing, who um, Tom Demery tried to suspend, Hunter, our Hunter Cushing, Deputy Assistant Secretary for Multifamily Housing Programs. Uh, he will be testifying before us. Uh, he appears to be a, a player. Uh, I'd like to know if you had any contact with him and if in your judgment he had any activity while you were there in the Mod Rehab Program. I think he may have assisted. Uh, he, before he was uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary for Multifamily Housing Programs, he was <clears throat> Special Assistant to the Secretary and he may have uh, been involved from, you know, with the secretary's office at that time. I can't speculate exactly what it was. When he then went to, when he then went to uh, the Office of Multifamily Housing Programs, he had to sign off on the documents, as I indicated to Congressman Morrison, um, to prove that, the, you know, to certify, in fact, that the units were, in fact, available. Are, and these, when, are these when, the rapid reply memos? Yes, sir. Now, he was not in this position, though, when you were um, the acting when I was acting, he was, when I became, when I left the position as Deputy Assistant Secretary to the, uh, to the acting assistant, I'm sorry, when I left DAS for multifamily housing programs and went to the general deputy position, Hunter was put in my place in that position as Deputy Assistant Secretary. So, in, so order, in, in order for these projects to be funded, he would have to sign off on that, it. That is correct. Yeah. Did you ever have any uh, uh, discussions with him about particular projects that should be funded or not? Not particular projects. Uh, I do remember talking to him about the Mod Rehab Program, but once again, I can't remember specifics. I do not remember talking about specific okay. projects. So the bottom line is why you were the acting, you did not have much interaction with him. On that issue, that is yes. correct. Thank you. On the Mod Rehab. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> we want to thank you very much, uh, <clears throat> Mr. Di Um The subcommittee may submit some questions to you in writing. We would appreciate if you could respond to those uh, expeditiously. We want to thank you for your cooperation. Thank you. Uh, the next uh, witness is uh, Ms. Deborah Dean former executive assistant to the secretary of the Department of Housing and Urban Development. Ms. Dean, please uh, come up to the witness table. Would you please raise your right hand and repeat after me? Yes. I do solemnly swear tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help you God. I do. Please be seated. <clears throat> For the record, uh, Ms. Dean, the chair would like to note that you are appearing under a subpoena duly issued by this committee, and we are pleased to have your presence. You may identify the gentleman who accompany you. Thank and I'd be grateful if you'd speak into the microphone. All right. My name is Deborah Gore Dean, D-E-A-N, and I am represented by counsel, Mr. Joseph DeGeneva on my right and Mr. Charles Lieber on my left. We are pleased to have both of your counsels with you. <clears throat> Do you have any opening statement? Yes, sir. Please. Mr. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, members of the Employment and Housing Subcommittee, and members of the Housing and Community Development Subcommittee, in view of my present inability to obtain access to the HUD records which would enable me to prepare adequately for testimony that would be complete and truthful, I have accepted the advice of my counsel to decline, respectfully, to answer any questions posed by the subcommittee at this time on the basis of the rights guaranteed to me by the Fifth Amendment to the Constitution of the United States. Ms. Dean, uh, um, the Fifth Amendment is a treasured and valued part of our Constitution, and uh, this subcommittee will certainly honor any claim of the Fifth Amendment uh, on your part. But I would like to explore uh, some matters with you, uh, which in, uh, in no sense, uh, I believe, would 
tend to incriminate you. Now let me first say, in response to your brief opening statement, uh, that I am very sympathetic uh, to the issue of uh, your needing access to the tremendous range of documents uh, that you came in contact with during your service at HUD. And as chairman, I want to assure you that if uh, any question is raised, either by the chair or by any member of this subcommittee, uh, and you feel that a particular document that is not available to you at the moment would be required for you to give an honest and accurate statement, the chair will excuse you from answering any such question. Do you understand what I've just said? Yes, sir. I'm sorry? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, let me therefore, let me therefore begin my questions and if uh, you feel either that you need a specific document or that you wish to assert your uh, Fifth Amendment privilege, please so indicate. My first question is, when did you start working at HUD? Mr. Chairman, I have accepted the advice of my counsel to decline respectfully to answer any questions posed by the subcommittee at this time based on the rights guaranteed to me by the Fifth Amendment. Well, am I to understand, Ms. Dean, and if I so understand, I, I, uh, uh, I will regret this, that you are unprepared to answer even totally factual questions such as the commencement of your service at HUD or the length of your service at HUD? Mr. Chairman, my counsel have advised me to limit my answers to the statement which I have just read, and I have accepted that advice. As you well know, Ms. Dean, uh, over the long history of uh, congressional investigations, uh, it's often been uh, uh, the practice of uh, chairman of committees, uh, despite the clear and unequivocal statement such as the one you have made, to ask a very long series of questions and in each instance uh, obtain the same answer. I shall not uh, uh, put you to that inconvenience and embarrassment. It is not the purpose of this subcommittee to embarrass any, any witness. It certainly is not my purpose to embarrass you in any shape, manner, or form. Uh, I regret that at this moment you are unable on the advice of your counsel to answer any questions. I hope that uh, you will obtain whatever documentation you feel you need to answer questions. Let me assure you that the chairman of this subcommittee will Let me assure you that the chairman of this subcommittee will use all of his resources to assist you in obtaining whatever documentation you need from the Department of Housing and Urban Development. I think elementary fairness demands that you have access to whatever documents you feel you need. Uh, therefore, I would like to make an offer to you and to your counsel uh, that my office is available to you as of uh, the conclusion of this hearing to assist you in obtaining any and all documents you feel uh, that will make your testimony more fair and, uh, and more reasonable. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You're, Mr. you're Chairman. Mo most welcome. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman. Chairman, you. Mr. Chairman. Uh, yes, I would first like to ask whether my colleague, Mr. Shades, who I think is the only member present who is a member of the subcommittee, has any question or comment, then I'll turn to my other colleagues. 
Mr. Chairman, maybe uh, the questions of my other colleagues will answer my question, but my general uh, concern is um, whether she has, in fact, asked for specific documents or whether she is, in fact, asking for such a long list as to uh, prevent us from ever complying with her request. And if that were the case, then I would feel that uh, the Fifth Amendment is uh, being misused. And I just want to publicly state that. Uh, I frankly see no reason why she should not be able to testify like everyone else has testified, though it's her choice. And I just say to you that uh, counsel can recommend anything they want, but ultimately it's the individual that has to make that decision. So I just hope that you feel, Mr. Chairman, that her request for specific documents is something we can comply with or whether you feel in judgment uh, that it, she's asking for such a laundry list as to make her testimony here uh, never to occur. That's my concern. Well, in response to my friend and colleague from Connecticut, uh, I would merely like to state that uh, uh, Ms. Dean's uh, counsel submitted a very extensive list of items that uh, uh, counsel feels uh, is necessary for her to conduct her testimony. Uh, I will do my utmost, as I indicated, to cooperate with her and with counsel to obtain uh, all of the items that they request uh, because I believe that uh, the request is made in good faith and uh, the chair will do uh, his utmost to, to assist you in obtaining these, these documents. Mr. Chairman, I respect your decision and have uh, nothing but admiration for how you have conducted these hearings. And uh, if ultimately that uh, ends us with the opportunity to have Ms. Dean testify, uh, then, then I concur with it. I thank my colleague for his comment. Congresswoman Rukema. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I don't know if the chairman knows the answer to this question. Therefore, I will direct it to either the witness or her counsel. <clears throat> Can you? Um, Tell me, because I do not know, um, have you been directly blocked from gaining access to the papers that are in question, or is it a function of time? I believe that my statement before is in view of my present inability to obtain access to the HUD records. Uh, if there's a further question, um, Mr. Chairman, perhaps we could swear in Mr. DeGeneva and he could respond in more detail. I would appreciate that, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. DeGeneva, um, would you please stand? Mr. Chairman, if you wish. Mr. Chairman, I don't think it's don't. necessary for me to be sworn as counsel. Okay. Uh, the, let me just represent to the committee, Mr. Chairman, that we have indeed filed FOIA requests with the Department of Housing and Urban Development uh, immediately upon being notified of our, the request to be present uh, for these hearings. Those requests have not been complied with uh, by the Department of Housing and Urban Development, and we are awaiting compliance with those requests. Have you been given any indication as may to... I, may I also add, uh, Congresswoman, sorry, excuse me, that we also met with the staff of the committee and discussed these matters and indeed sent them a letter indicating the types and kinds and specific documents with which we had great interest in order to prepare someone to accurately and faithfully and truthfully provide the testimony in this important matter. Do you have any estimate as to uh, the time that you will, will be necessary for you to properly prepare the witness? Uh, Congressman Rugema, uh, with all due respect, until we see the documents, and, and they are extensive. It would be really uh, inappropriate for me to try to give you an estimate of what it would take to properly prepare a witness. Let me ask again, Mr. DiGenova, um, is there any indication uh, that there has been um, uh, an effort to block your access or, um, or any um, dilatory tactics in in, on the part of the Department of HUD? Not at this time. Thank you, sir. If I, if I uh, uh, may pursue this matter just a bit further, um, it is the intention of the chairman of this subcommittee to uh, talk to Secretary Kemp early this afternoon on this matter. 
and uh, requests his cooperation so that at an early date, Ms. Dean will have an opportunity to uh, testify without feeling the obligation to take the Fifth Amendment. Are there any other colleagues who would like to, uh, Congressman Morrison? I'd just like to probe a little further, I, whether Ms. Dean or, or her counsel wants to answer this. Um, do I understand the assertion of, uh, the, the sole assertion being made that uh, because there are, there's no access to documents that the answer to any question would incriminate the witness? Is that the, is that the claim? Is that all the claim or is there more to the claim? Chairman, may I have permission to respond to that Please. question? Congressman Morrison, the basis of the claim is as described in the witness's initial answer. Uh, I think that the committee is entitled, if your counsel making a legal claim before this committee, that the committee is entitled to an explanation of what the legal claim is. And I've asked, I've asked that, and I haven't asked the witness to answer anything. So you Com as counsel, who is, I guess, not a potted plant, can tell me um, whether the, the legal claim being asserted here is based solely on the, in it, the lack of access to documents. Congressman Morrison. Uh, would you our, be so kind to speak into the microphone? Our position is based on our judgment that it would be inappropriate to give our client any advice other than what we have, give, have given her without access to all the appropriate records which we have requested. It is and has been held by the Supreme Court that it is a sufficient basis for asserting the Fifth Amendment privilege where any answer which the witness could give may or could expose that witness to prosecution. And I do not believe we are obligated under the law to articulate any basis beyond that. And is it your uh, position that um, uh, the committee cannot inquire into what attempts have been made to secure the document? Not at all, sir. And in fact, inquiries were made. We received those inquiries, and I believe we've just responded to them. And as I believe my co-counsel has stated, we have met on a number of occasions with staff counsel to the subcommittee to specify what steps we have taken, what documents we have requested. And uh, there is a record, of course, within HUD as to what documents we have requested. We have not received a response yet, uh, but we are not prepared to say that they have been either dilatory or uh, attempted at this point to uh, discourage or obstruct our request. Are you prepared to say that you've requested all the documents that are necessary for you to prepare this uh, witness? Based on our judgment at this time. Um, Mr. Chairman, I just have one, one comment to make. Um, something I'm concerned about, not about this particular moment, because I think that uh, um, time will tell whether, in fact, we're uh, on a, being diverted from the purpose of the, of the committee or whether, whether, in fact, the documents are necessary. But I am concerned um, in the following Catch-22. We are hearing from the Justice Department that they don't take this matter seriously, at least those are the reports, and we have the Inspector General suggesting that there's no criminal conduct involved, and yet in, um, in this particular instance, of course, uh, the assertion of uh, a risk of criminal prosecution is being put before us. Uh, I would hope that if, um, if in fact, uh, there is a feeling by any of our witnesses that they are facing criminal liability, that that will suggest to the Justice Department that there may be criminal conduct here of which someone is guilty, and they ought to be pursuing this matter more aggressively than they seem to have up to date. Thank you. Thank you for your comment, Congressman Schumer. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, the bottom line question, I guess, for us is, is this attempt to retrieve documents an honest attempt to protect the witness's rights, or is it simply a long dilatory process that will get us nowhere? For instance, in your letter to the subcommittee, you've requested all of no, item number 10. <coughs> All official and unofficial logs, diaries, appointment books reflecting the meetings and telephone conversations of Secretary Pierce during the period January 1st, 84 through December 31st, 1988. I would suggest to you that 98% of those materials are probably irrelevant to your client. 
If Secretary Pierce took a trip somewhere uh, to visit something, if Secretary Pierce had phone calls of natures unrelated to Ms. Dean, why do you need those? And it makes me at least believe that we may, you, that we may be ending up here, whether by design or otherwise, in a catch-22 where Secretary Pierce could go and assert that you have no right to his entire phone logs and appointments. Uh, isn't, this, isn't this request unduly broad, even assuming the defend, uh, the, excuse me, the witness's Fifth Amendment uh, rights? I, I think not, Congressman Schumer. You may recall that Secretary Pierce testified that such logs were not kept. They did not exist. We have reason to believe that they were kept and do exist. Well, that's very interesting to note for the committee's point of view, and as a gentleman from Connecticut has said, from the Justice Department's point of view, now that it does seem there may well be, at least in the thoughts of some, some criminal liability here, but you're here not, you're on that side of the table, not this side of the table, and as much as we would like to get hold of uh, the Secretary's logs, tell me how things that did not involve Ms. Dean are relevant to the inquiry. Congressman Schumer, if we knew... To your, rather, not relevant to the inquiry, excuse me, are relevant to your job as protecting the rights, as you should, of, of, of the witness. And I understand your quest question. If we knew the particular dates, if Ms. Dean's power of recollection was such that we could request particular dates, we certainly would. But given that these events about which you would like to question the witness occurred in many instances as long as three or four years ago, she is incapable of recalling those specific dates. And so therefore, we have to request the entire log. It may be that upon our review, we would find that only portions of it are relevant. But we can't predict at this time that any particular month Would you be satisfied if, they, if somebody went through those logs and just excerpted the parts that were relevant to Ms. Dean? It would depend on who that somebody was. But somebody fair and uh, someone without an axe to grind. Well, Perhaps it, it would depend way. again on who that somebody was. Yeah. I appreciate my colleagues volunteering no, 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 for but that, I, uh, that exciting assignment, but, I, but I respectfully well. decline. Yeah. I respectfully my point, decline. Mr. Chairman, and I think it is a serious point, is that if you look at some of the requests in the letter, they are so wide-ranging and so broad that, number one, they extend far beyond the purview of Ms. Dean's activities. Number two, they could almost never be met, some of them, or uh, especially when there are letters like all. Um, and what I'm trying to get the bottom of here is, is counsel's job to actually furnish the documents so that Ms. Dean can reflect, uh, refresh her recollection and do everything else that a witness is entitled to do? Or is it simply a gigantic roadblock thrown in the way of this investigation, uh, in this, this hearing, that we will never, never uh, get around? And uh, I'm looking at the list, I'm not quite sure. It doesn't say all official and unofficial logs of the secretary that are relevant to Ms. Dean. If I may, if I may uh, try to respond uh, uh, from the chairman's point of view, the chairman at this stage has no reason to assume that uh, Ms. Dean is attempting to permanently delay uh, the proper course of uh, these hearings. Uh, I am assuming that both she and her attorneys are acting in good faith. I shall approach uh, Secretary Kemp as well as the General Counsel of HUD this afternoon uh, to try to see how the subcommittee can facilitate and expedite and accelerate your obtaining all the relevant documents that might be useful in, in preparing your, your testimony before this uh, subcommittee. Um, Congressman Shays. Mr. Chairman, I'd, I'd just like to associate myself with my colleague, uh, Mr. Schumer and, and, and Mr. Morrison. Uh, I was under the general assumption, and they may not have agreed with me on this, that we were dealing with a scandal, that it was a pretty smelly business, but that probably no laws were broken and no regulations were broken. And so we would learn a lot about how HUD operates, but that no one ultimately would be sent to jail or indicted and so on. And I just have to say for the record that I find it absolutely astounding that the IG would investigate everyone else and we would have everyone else willing to testify without counsel 
and the very person who it appears may be at the very center of this, of this problem uh, was not investigated. Uh, no records were subpoenaed by the IG's office. And I have to tell you, uh, I hope that we have the IG come back to us, because I think he's got a lot of explaining to do. And I just might say to, to you, Ms. Gore, that, that uh, you've opened my eyes to the possibility that while you may not have been involved in some criminal law being violated, uh, clearly you feel someone was, uh, and maybe you. And um, time will tell, but I will be uh, using my office to encourage the Justice Department uh, to pursue this case with some vigor. Would gentlemen Mr. yield? Uh, I would, um, I would um, uh, want to uh, comment to my very good friend and colleague from Connecticut that the Inspector General will appear before this subcommittee on Friday of this week. And um, it will be perfectly appropriate for us to explore the issues that you have Chairman. raised. Congressman Schumer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I would just say uh, to the witness that I think what has happened just here does re escalate uh, the importance of this hearing and investigation. It certainly casts into doubt uh, the IG's assertion, the Justice Department's assertion, and all other assertions that it's clear that no criminal laws were broken. And I just hope we will continue, given those constraints, to pursue this investigation as vigorously as possible. Just to reiterate, I join with all of those who mentioned the fact that uh, we ought to ask the Justice Department to, to take another look at this. Mr. Chairman, may I have permission Please. to address the chair? Please. Just to clarify one point here, because there's been some suggestion that by invoking the privilege here today, the witness is somehow acknowledging that there were some criminal actions performed on her part. And I would simply like to remind the members of something which I'm sure many of them who are members of the bar and officers of the court already know, and that is that the Fifth Amendment privilege is intended to act as a shield for the innocent. And so I would hope that none of the members would suggest, and I would feel it would be regret regrettable if they did, that by her invoking the privilege here today, she's somehow acknowledging wrongdoing. Speaking uh, for myself, uh, the, the, the chair is in full accord with your interpretation of the Fifth Amendment. Would the, would the chairman yield? Yes. Uh, I'd first like to, to point out it was the former Attorney General of the United States, Mr. Meese, who got confused about the Fifth Amendment and whether or not it provided a shield only for the guilty. And I certainly acknowledge that the uh, counsel is correct, that there is no suggestion of guilt. And in fact, if uh, this were a court proceeding, perhaps we couldn't make reference to the, uh, to the use of the privilege at certain points. However, the fact that any witness would feel the threat of this investigation turning to a criminal investigation merely suggests that the questions that are being raised are serious ones that, in my opinion, the Justice Department passed them off rather lightly, and they don't deserve to be passed off lightly, and it doesn't matter whether Ms. Dean takes the fifth or not, they're still serious questions, and I w would like the Justice Department to look again. Are there any other comments uh, from any of my colleagues in the panel? Uh, if not, uh, let me just say, uh, with uh, all due respect that it is our earnest hope that uh, before long you will be able to change your position because I believe uh, uh, it would be your intention also to cooperate fully with this subcommittee as have all of the other witnesses and I trust that uh, the documentation you truly require will be forthcoming I would also hope that you and your attorneys will be flexible in the extent of the documentation uh, that you will insist on, because I believe uh, uh, while this list uh, was prepared with care, uh, some review by counsel may be appropriate. Without objection, the chair would like to place in the record uh, a letter from uh, uh, Ms. Dean's counsel outlining the specific documents uh, they are requesting from HUD. Uh, without objection, that uh, letter will be placed in the record. Subcommittee is now adjourned.
Join us this Sunday at 5 p.m. Eastern Time, 2 Pacific, for a conference titled Relations with Japan and Europe. It's sponsored by the American Assembly, and that's located at Columbia University. That's a forum on U.S. interests in Europe and Japan, Sunday at 5 p.m. Eastern Time, 2 Pacific, here on C-SPAN. Coming up next, lawmakers react to President Bush's veto of the minimum wage bill. Good day from Washington. You're watching C-SPAN.